So today the debate is about, in my view, uh, I would argue continuity. We want to see which religion, whether Islam or Christianity, actually has continuity with the religion that's laid down in the Law and the Prophets. And that image there, we're not going to go too deep into it right now, but we'll get into it here in a little bit. And I might uh, go back and forth between screen share and uh, some of the stuff I've got over here to show. The first question I would ask uh, in regard to this debate is, how would a 7th century Jew or Christian verify the Quranic claims? In the Quran, many places we're told that its hearers and readers should go to the Torah and to the Injil or the Gospel. This assumes a degree of continuity which could only be validated with the existing manuscripts and textual traditions that are already possessed by both Jews and Christians in the previous centuries. As laid down in a divine revelation in Deuteronomy 13 and 18, any subsequent prophetic revelation must meet the test of consistency with prior revelation. This here uh, would refer to the prior existing Torah, whether oral or written, including subsequent divine revelation found in the wisdom text, the historical books, liturgical texts, and the major and minor prophets. Islam and the Quran do not merely contradict prior revelation in a few minor areas, but rather gigantic portions of the Torah and the prophets are discarded due to obvious contradictions, inaccuracies, and inconsistencies with the Quranic account. Deuteronomy 13 and 18, for example, lay down the law that I mentioned earlier about how we test for subsequent prophetic claims. So thankfully, a Jew or a Christian in the seventh century who would hear the claims of the Quran has a, a convenient test, a way to go and see if the revelations given to Muhammad are consistent with prior revelations. So we know here in Deuteronomy 13 and 18 that they would have to be consistent with prior revelation. That test is also echoed, as you see there in Isaiah 8, 20, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this law, there is no light in them. The next uh, thing that has to be shown, which I may cause uh, some people some surprise, uh, is that the Old Testament prophets were Trinitarian. They were not Unitarian. Judaism, specifically in the Second Temple period, was not a monolithic Unitarian enterprise. The question becomes, what are the teachings of the prophets at, uh, in the Old Testament? Did they uh, actually teach, as Islam says, a radical Unitarianism? Or is it something more fluid, or is there differentiation in Yahweh? In fact, modern Jewish scholarship unanimously is, un, uh, is undecided on this question. There's a lot of Jewish scholarship that is uh, listed here. For example, Daniel Boyarin. Uh, later, I have Summer and I have uh, Siegel. And they admit that in the Old Testament itself, not due to Christian deviation, but in, in the Old Testament itself, we find many, many passages that show uh, differentiation in Yahweh. That differentiation is not just uh, located in rabbinic debates. It also continues into later medieval debates with Jewish Kabbalah. And you can see there, for example, Gershom Sholem in his uh, book on Kabbalah. He's the uh, respected Kabbalist uh, uh, theologian of the Middle Ages or uh, scholar of, of medieval Kabbalah. He points out, for example, the be three beginningless lights that are mentioned. Now, I'm not a Kabbalist. I'm just pointing out that this shows that the Jewish tradition is not monolithic in its presentation. So, uh, I'd like to come back then to uh, my screen, uh, to me here, and point out that the first display of Trinitarian theology in the Law and the Prophets is, for example, here on this whiteboard. And I'm showing this whiteboard because, hopefully you guys can see this, uh, this is a tremendous amount of text. And I'm just citing these because there's too many to fit on uh, a single screen there with uh, typing it all out. You can screenshot this later and go check the, ver the various textual references here for just examples of theophanies. And the reason I've included the theophanies is that these are particularly useful for demonstrating the manifestation of Yahweh in the Old Testament, proving differentiation. So not just Yahweh, but also the angel messenger that he sends, who has the name of Yahweh, as we read in Exodus, the same angel that's present in the burning bush. That angel is spoken of as the uh, messenger of the covenant. He's spoken of as in Judges turning the face of Yahweh towards Gideon in Judges 6, and many, many other passages where he's identified, for example, in Judges 13 as the uh, angel of wonderful counsel. <clears throat> so you can check those references later, or we can go back to any of those. And so let me go back to my screen share here and point out that the uh, 
triad there, I don't mean to argue either that the Old Testament explicitly uses the word the words triad. No, all that's necessary, as the Jewish scholars are admitting, is that the uh, the Old Testament believers spoke of Father, Angel, of the Lord, or Son of Man, and the Spirit in a real distinctive way, and they do. Although many in modern um, in modernity assume that the law and the prophets were strictly Unitarian. Jewish scholar Daniel Buaren notes that early Christianity actually represents a conservative form of Judaism that sought to remain faithful to the totality of Revelation and the Law and the Prophets, including the texts which portray uh, differing his, uh, hypostases in God. Another example of this is a uh, recent Jewish scholarship on divine fluidity and divine embodiment in the Law and the Prophets. Now, again, I'm not Jewish. I'm just pointing out that the admissions of Jewish scholarship are to our position nowadays. We are in, in the Jewish Gospels. The story of the Jewish Christ notes, for example, just from the example uh, from the, the text of Daniel 7, we have the discussion of the Messiah being divine, the Messiah being in human form, the Messiah appearing as younger than the Ancient of Days, uh, the divinity of Ancient of Days. We have the Messiah appearing uh, uh, eventually enthroned upon high and being given dominion and authority over earth. That is the, ascent, the, the ascension in, in Christian theology. Now, uh, early on in uh, the early days of Christianity, there were already rabbinical debates before Christianity and rabbinic Judaism uh, completely parted ways, where you even have people like famous rabbis like Rabbi Akiva, for example, admitting that there is multiplicity in some sense in the Godhead. This is covered in Alan Siegel's Two Powers in Heaven and in Schaefer's Two Gods in Heaven. Now, God is a generic term that can uh, pick out a specific hypostasis, and it can also pick out a generic nature. So when it says two gods or two powers, it's not indicating polytheism. It's merely indicating differentiation in the text. Now, again, I'm not arguing for Kabbalah. I'm just pointing out as an example that rabbinic Judaism is not a monolithic Unitarian philosophy. As Summer notes, this is a later Maimonidean feature and not a Kabbalistic or uh, early Christian Judaic feature. Second Temple Judaism and Christian uh, in Jewish scholarship was not monolithic. It was not radical Unitarian. It was fluid, and it did not admit God to be multiple due to later accretions. In fact, uh, Siegel and Summers and other admit that you can have a multiplicity of personae in early Jewish theology without that necessitating, for example, multiple wills. This is also seen in the process of the rabbis in their eventual exclusion of Logos theology, which is not a direct import from Hellenism per se, but rather from the wisdom text of the Old Testament, the Solomonic literature, and so forth. Jewish scholars like uh, Simeon Halevi, Sholem, Liaren, Siegel, and Summer admit that rabbinical dialogues and debates on the wisdom logos text and the Merkabah chariot mysticism that draws from both the Psalms, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Enochic literature all posit various divine embodiments, manifestations, and even incarnation. In fact, ancient rabbinical dialogues discuss the divine Messiah suffering, dying, and perhaps even atoning. One example is Rabbi Hagalili in Boyarin's Jewish Gospels discussing the atoning death. Uh, and then my friend, uh, the Jewish Messianic Christian, Ken Ami, has a book, Jewish, uh, The Jewish Messiah is a, is a Judaism versus Judaism debate. Again, just illustrating that Judaism is not a monolithic enterprise. Now, as uh, we get back to embodiment, Jewish scholar Benjamin Sommer notes in his Law and the Prophets that they themselves, in many texts that I cited in my uh, big whiteboard there, display what he calls fluidity of Yahweh's ability to be both imminent and transcendent, as well as manifesting at certain times and in certain places in special modes and in special presences. This does not entail or necessitate a change in Yahweh's essence or nature, but rather that he's able to be embodied or to manifest in various and distinct ways. Summer even admits the dispute, again, was not over a strict numerical oneness, because many people in the ancient world did not always count by strict identity, but rather by division. Whether this distinction, the hypostasis, allowed for multiple wills is the real issue, according to Summer, and that, of course, is something that Trinitarians reject. We do not believe in multiple wills in the Godhead. Summer cites many of the holy places and iconography iconography replete throughout the Old Testament Law and Prophets, including altar stones, trees, which are dedicated to Yahweh. Uh, uh, they're made holy in anticipation of the temple and tabernacle liturgical services, which will also embody Yahweh above the ark, the Shekinah, and so forth, the cloud, while at the same time not embodying the divine essence or in any way altering Yahweh. 
that this, as a side note, the Quran also appears to have inadvertently left these references to this special presence in texts like uh, Surah 671 to 80, 1171 to 5128. Now, uh, the challenge then, as I would put it to Daniel, would be to leave him in a, uh, on the horns of a dilemma because Daniel can admit the law and the prophets are thus majorly corrupted or entirely corrupted. But if this is the case, he will have to give an account for why the, the Quran cites massive portions of the law and the prophets as reliable and the very thing that Christians and Jews can go to to verify the claims of the Quran. In fact, this is more challenging than it might first be apparent because we've already seen from uh, the test itself in terms of prior revelation that, that this places the burden of proof on the newer, later revelation and not vice versa. Second, Daniel must also give a non-circular epistemic criterion for how he knows which texts in the law and prophets are now, quote, corrupt and which ones are, quote, authentic. He cannot simply cite the Quran as his epistemic principle since the Quran is the very thing in question. Remember, the later revelation has a burden of proof for consistency, and hence why the 7th century Jew or Christian has no other possible means to verify the Quranic claims than to go to the older extant Jewish and Christian texts. As it turns out, this option is uh, arbitrary and a double standard on the part of Daniel picking and choosing hundreds of texts that he does like, while then simultaneously tossing out hundreds of other texts that he will see as corrupted. Without a clear epistemic principle to justify this ad hoc position, it is completely incoherent. Daniel should also show that the, at the time of the Quran's appearance, there was proof or evidence of mass textual corruption at that time, and not a later Islamic accretion argument based on the arbitrary uh, ad hoc use of liberal textual scholarship. Daniel, by the way, is arbitrary in the Hashmi debate when he says that he does not mind the uh, higher critical method being used against Judaism and Christianity because he argues that they evolved. Of course, I doubt that the, uh, Daniel would like that to be done to Islam and he would reject those out of hand. The other option on the horns of the dilemma for Daniel is to say that the law and the prophets are not essentially corrupted or made unreliable, but that they do not teach any form of real differentiation or Trinitarianism or distinction in Yahweh. In this case, you will have to explain the vast sampling of texts that I showed on the whiteboard, and there are more the examples than what I gave uh, the, than just theophanies. There are plenty of texts that even show, for example, three hypostases, Father, Angel, and Spirit as somehow consistent then with his radical Unitarian presupposition. That's what Islam is based on, a radical Unitarian presupposition. And this, of course, is part of the reason why they reject uh, the New Testament and its uh, argumentation for distinctions in God and Jesus being the Messiah. Somehow, uh, I think this is going to be, well, this is an impossible task, and this is why the Jewish scholars I mentioned back up what I'm arguing. Uh, Second Temple Judaism was just simply not a monolithic uh, entity. Next, I want to go to Quran uh, scholar Gabriel Said Reynolds, and in this text, we're going to see uh, several examples of where the Quran presupposes the biblical narratives, but offers no coherent account. In fact, it garbles and messes up a lot of the stories, and the narratives are not even consistent. For example, angels, angels are told to prostrate to Adam, but Adam is said to be still the image of Allah, and yet nothing is like Allah. This is uh, Quran 42.11, where it says nothing is like Allah. Satan's fall, the entire cosmology is assumed. You can look at Reynolds, page 54, uh, and there's a multiple text is why I put Reynolds 54. Abraham is a uh, rational, natural theologian, but also perhaps an idolater who changes position. And also Genesis 18 has a lot in their midst there, uh, Quran 11, 69, 72. Sarah laughs before the announcement, uh, which doesn't make any sense because that's the naming of her son on the basis of the laughing when she's told that she would have uh, a son in her old age. Nimrod and Hamad are confused with Pharaoh. There are Sabbath contradictions that the Sabbath is not from God. The Jonah story is incoherent. It's not explained why he leaves. Rather, uh, Jonah is mentioned, and this is a really important point, and yet crucial major and minor prophets are never given any place or listing in terms of their significance in the Quran. We have, for example, Korah's rebellion mentioned in the Quran, but nothing from Jeremiah, Isaiah, or the Psalms. And perhaps that's because Jeremiah, Isaiah, and the Psalms are tremendously important for the meaning and significance of Jesus's life and ministry, particularly Isaiah as what many have called the fifth gospel, because there's so many messianic prophecies there. But it makes sense that if you were a religion based on a hodgepodge, you would want to ignore or you just simply don't understand things like what's in Isaiah. There's other examples, too, that you can see there, the martyrs eating uh, and the uh, reliance of the Quran on things like the Proto-Evangelium of James, the Talmud. But I want to move on down to the key point here, which is that it's not just a question of the divine unity, but a question of 
the work of the Messiah, the heavenly temple, an everlasting priesthood, a sacrifice and worship, all of which are required, including the altar uh, in the Old Testament, which, as you can see, Islam has none of, and so it has no continuity with the Old Testament. The debate topic is Christianity versus Islam, which is the religion of the prophets. The first question is, what do we take as our source of information about the prophets? Is it the Bible or is it the Quran? Obviously, if we use the Bible as our only source of information, that biases the debate in favor of Christianity. And if we use the Quran as our source, that biases the debate in favor of Islam. So this is a kind of stalemate because ultimately Christians don't take the Quran as authoritative and Muslims don't take the Bible as authoritative. So there has to be a separate argument. Let's play on the Christian home field for a second and take the Old Testament as the definitive source of information about the prophets. Even in that case, there's a strong argument that Islam is more aligned with the prophets than Christianity is. The most important prophet in the Old Testament is Moses. Moses preaches monotheism and bans idolatry, very similar to Islam. Moses establishes Mosaic law, which has many similarities with the Sharia in Islam. For example, Mosaic law includes an extensive set of rituals involving animal sacrifice, periodic liturgical prayer, pilgrimage, fasting, and purification rituals, analogs of which are found in Islam. Also, Mosaic law includes various moral norms like charity, punishment for sex crimes like adultery and homosexuality, patriarchal marriage, including polygyny, blasphemy punishments, rules and regulations concerning slavery, the prohibition of usury, dietary restrictions, and much more, all of which are preserved and practiced in Islam. Fourth, the Mosaic law, similar to the Sharia, mandates theocratic governance because a theocratic state is necessary to apply all these Mosaic rules. Fifth, the Mosaic law prescribes imperial warfare, just like Islam, and we could go on. But the point is that when it comes to beliefs, rituals, and norms, Islam has a great deal of continuity with the Old Testament, and in particular, the doctrines attributed to the most important prophet in the Old Testament, namely Moses. The major difference between the Mosaic law and Sharia is that the Mosaic law was for the Israelites, but Sharia is for all Gentiles. In other words, Moses brings divine laws to the Israelites, but Muhammad وسلم, brings divine law to all peoples. So we could make this debate all about the Old Testament and go back and forth arguing for a Muslim reading or a Christian reading. Unfortunately, this back and forth would go nowhere. And this is because the Old Testament is fundamentally contradictory. That's the root of the problem. For example, the Old Testament contains statements endorsing monotheism. Islam is consistent with those statements. But the Old Testament also contains statements endorsing polytheism. And Christianity is more consistent with those. So if we're just limiting the debate to which religion is consistent with the Old Testament, there isn't going to be a decisive winner simply because the Old Testament and the Bible as a whole contradicts itself on many fundamental questions. Here are the biggest examples. Is there one God or multiple gods? Some biblical passages endorse strict monotheism. Others endorse polytheism. All academic scholarship on the Bible recognizes that it contains many polytheistic statements, and this is apparent when we read academic translations like the New Revised Standard Version. In Exodus 15, 11, Moses declares, who is like you among the gods, O Yahweh? The phrase among the gods implies there are multiple gods who exist, but Yahweh is superior to those other gods. Psalm 82, 1 reads, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Psalm 86, 8 reads, there is none like you among the gods. O Lord. Many more passages could be cited with this same idea that multiple gods exist. This is not monotheism. To complicate matter, matters further, the Old Testament also refers to Jewish kings such as David and Solomon as messiahs and sons of God. In some passages, such a messiah is even referred to as God. This can be seen in Psalm 45, where the king is addressed as a God who has been anointed by the supreme God. Number two, what is Jesus's relationship to Father God? The New Testament has different views, including Jesus is less than the Father, and Jesus is identical to the Father. Later, Christians mix, the, mix these ideas into the Trinitarian doctrine. Number three, should Mosaic law continue to be observed? The New Testament has different views, including a Jewish Christian view that endorses continued Torah observance versus a Pauline Christian view that endorses a general abolition of the Mosaic law. 
Number four, do religious authorities like priests have the ability to significantly alter or add to religious doctrines by way of ongoing prophecy or councils? The Old Testament and New Testament contain contradictory views on this. So on a plain reading, there are, these are major contradictions in the Bible concerning the most fundamental questions of theology. Due to these contradictions, we can argue endlessly about whether Islam or Christianity is more consistent with the prophets. Ultimately, I think Islam is more consistent with the law-oriented monotheism of Moses in the Old Testament, whereas Christianity is more consistent with the polytheism found in some passages, but we don't have to limit the debate to just analyzing the Bible. There are other arguments that can be made to show that Christianity, due to its structure, is not able to preserve teachings over time, whereas Islam is able to do so. Consider the following argument. When scripture has deep internal contradictions, the contradictions produce radical sectarian splits within the religious community. That community can only be kept together by organizing religious councils with the authority to resolve the contradictions and establish more coherent doctrines that are not explicit in scripture itself. This is what church councils are for. The new doctrines established by these church councils are then treated as ongoing new revelation. Christians believe that after the time of Jesus, the apostles and then later bishops meet in these infallible councils, which are divinely guided by the Holy Spirit. In other words, revelation did not stop with Jesus. Rather, revelation is ongoing through these councils that are guided by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are two major problems with this, specifically when it comes to the issue of preservation of doctrine. First is the problem of circularity. We can ask Jay or any Eastern Orthodox Christian who defines Christianity. He would answer the church tradition. Okay, so where can we find the proof that the church tradition preserved the religion of the prophets? He would say the proof is the Bible. Okay, but how do we correctly interpret the Bible? He would say, we correctly interpret the Bible by referring to the church tradition. So this is a circle. There is no independent reason outside of the church tradition to accept that Christianity has preserved the teachings of the prophets. We just have to accept it based on assertion. So why even have this debate if there's no independent reason that can be supplied to support the Christian position? If my opponent does have a reason independent of the church for believing that Christianity is the religion of the prophets, I hope to hear what it is so that I can respond. But if he has no independent reason outside of the authority of the church, then he should acknowledge that. Now, Christians might say that Islam has the same exact problem. But this is not true. Islam is radically different from Judaism and Christianity. Islam's key religious text was laid down by its founder, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu The Quran puts forth the fundamental teachings of Islam with respect to theological doctrines like the six pillars of Iman, rituals like the five pillars, and other norms such as sexual prohibitions, patriarchal marriage, prohibition of intoxicants, etc., all of which have been preserved to this day. The Quran is delivered to us via one messenger, and the text was all established within his lifetime over the course of just 20 years. By contrast, the Bible comes to us via dozens or hundreds of authors and editors over many centuries. For this reason, the Quran is a more coherent, cohesive text compared to the Bible. But the important key here is that this is not just the opinion of Muslims. This is established academic consensus on the origins and the preservation of the Quran. Academics agree that the Quran has a core theology. For example, non-Muslim academics agree that the Quran is a monotheistic text. Non-Christian academics would not say the same thing about the Bible. On the question of the relationship between God and other figures like Jesus, again, non-Muslim academics agree that the Quran is clear that God does not have a son or take on a human nature or anything else like that. But non-Christian academics could not confirm that the Bible is clear on this issue. Same for the issue of observing the law. Non-Muslim academics agree that the Quran sets out a religious law and expects Muslims to follow it. Non-Christian academics cannot make any such definitive statement about the Bible. And finally, do religious figures have the authority to set new theological or moral doctrines? Academics agree that no such concept is set in the Quran, but the Bible is at best ambiguous. Another way to express this fundamental difference between the Bible and the Quran is like this. If academics want to know what Abraham Lincoln believed, they go to the historical record. If academics want to know what Julius Caesar believed, they go to the historical record. If academics want to know what Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam believed, they go to the historical record, to the Quran, to inscriptions, to Syriac manuscripts, and other historical sources. And based on these sources, academics have confirmed that the core beliefs and teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam have been preserved and are adopted by Muslims today. 
But the same cannot be said about the teachings of Jesus. Academics will speculate what Jesus may have believed by trying to piece together some coherent doctrine from the Gospels and other biblical manuscripts. Usually they can't come to a consensus. And even when they do, Christians reject their conclusions and assert that the only way to know what Jesus believed and taught is through the church. This is the key difference between Islam and Christianity. There's independent proof that Islam actually preserves teachings over time, whereas there's no ind independent proof that Christianity has been able to preserve the teachings of Jesus, let alone the prophets. The second problem is that because Christianity has this concept of ongoing revelation through infallible church councils, theology, morality, and ritual become highly susceptible to change over time. Councils introduce new doctrines such that traditional teachings are not preserved, including the teachings of the prophets. This is the biggest critique that many Christians made against the Catholic Church, with, which ultimately led to the schism between Catholic and Orthodox in 1054. The Catholics, Catholics kept introducing new doctrines that the Orthodox didn't accept like the filioque, papal supremacy, etc. Obviously, the Protestants rejected the Catholic Church in the 16th century for the same reason. This problem also affects the Eastern Orthodox, because orthodoxy relies on this notion of divinely guided councils. These count councils are highly influenced by political authority. This is called Caesaropapism. Political rulers appoint bishops with their preferred doctrinal views. They convene councils and affirm those preferred views, which are then enforced by the political authority. We see this from the beginning of Christianity with Constantine and other Byzantine emperors. As a result, the church tradition, starting with the earliest church fathers, is full of contradictions on fundamental theology. Here are just seven examples. Number one, Justin Martyr, one of the earliest church fathers, clearly says that Jesus the Son is another God that is numerically distinct from the Father. Martyr also says that Jesus the Son is a lesser divinity that acts as a mediator between God the Father and the physical world. Post-Nicene Christianity considers both of these ideas heresy. So how can Justin Martyr be both a saint, according to the Orthodox, but also advocate heretical understandings of God? Number two, Irenaeus, also considered a saint, says that the knowledge of the Father is distinct from the knowledge of the Son. This implies that the Father and the Son are of two distinct minds. This belief was later deemed a heresy by the church. Arianism, the claim that the Son is not co-eternal with the Father, was hotly debated in the first three centuries of Christianity. Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea to establish Trinitarianism and to eliminate Arianism. Monophysitism is the view that Jesus has only one divine nature rather than both divine and human natures. Emperor Theodosius II calls the Second Council of Ephesus, which affirms monophysitism. Several later emperors uphold this council. But ultimately, the Second Council of Ephesus was rejected in favor of the Council of Chalcedon, which denied monophysitism. Number five, iconoclasm is opposition to the veneration of religious images. Emperor Constantine V supports iconoclasm. The Council of Hyria endorsed the iconoclast position, but the Second Council of Nicaea rejected it. In the 18th and 19th centuries, number six, liberal dictators in Russia, like Peter and Catherine the Great, seized control of the Russian Orthodox Church and pushed liberal reforms. For example, Peter appointed Fyofan Prokopovich as archbishop to spearhead his church reforms. Fyofan championed reforms such as absolute political submission of the church to the state and replacement of the traditional patriarchate of Russia with the most holy governing synod. This synod consisted of a mix of clerics and laymen appointed by the czar. It was designed to give the czar more direct control of the church for secular purposes. Theophan also adopted the Protestant doctrine of salvation by faith alone. Number seven, in recent years, both the Russian and Greek Orthodox churches have put forth declarations favoring human rights. Notable is the 2020 Declaration for the Life of the World Towards a Social Ethos of the Orthodox Church. It endorses freedom of religion, freedom of speech, abolition of slavery, and capital punishment, condemns patriarchal sexism. But all this clearly contradicts the Bible, the patristic writings, Orthodox canon law, and the normative positions of the Orthodox Church for centuries. These are clear examples of how the church reverses itself due to political pressure. To recap, even if we concede that the Old Testament is the only source of information about the prophets, Islam is clearly more consistent with their overall teachings. However, the root problem is the Bible is self-contradictory, highly self-contradictory. Islam is consistent with the law-oriented monotheism of Moses, whereas Christianity is consistent with the polytheism found in the Old Testament.
But we don't have to get mired in negotiating these contradictory passages in the Old Testament. There are independent reasons to believe that Christianity cannot even preserve the teachings of Jesus, let alone the teachings of the prophets. Whereas with Islam, there are independent reasons to believe it is able to preserve prophetic teachings over the centuries. Thank you. I think, yeah, I think uh, Daniel did exactly what I expected. So I'm glad that he uh, said what he did because a lot of what he said would uh, really, I think, shoot him in the foot. And he, and he has done so because as I pointed out in my opening statement, the argument is, is really what is going to be the Quran's relationship to the Old Testament since it's the new revelation. Daniel went to great lengths to explain that the Quran was uh, consistent, coherent in his mind, historically accurate and so forth. And the Bible was full of contradictions, mistakes and errors. And I'm glad he did that because I have a list, for example, here of all of the many places just in two surahs where we have vast assumptions about the Old Testament texts and its veracity being the case. For example, we have in Surah 2, the story of Satan's fall and his relationship to Adam in the garden being correct, God's choice of the Jews and their uh, exaltation in the, in the nations. Uh, that's being uh, affirmed. The Exodus narrative is affirmed. The parting of the Red Sea is affirmed. The gold calf, golden calf. Moses, uh, quote, got scripture, we're told in Surah 2 from from Allah, cloud and manna, rebellion of Korah is cited, the book of the covenants is given, we're told about animal sacrifices, we're told about, uh, we sent, quote, prophets. Well, who would that be? Would that be Ezekiel, Isaiah, and Jeremiah that are completely ignored in the Quran, for example? We're told that the Quran confirms the scripture that we have already given. So the presupposition of the Quran is not that the Bible is full of errors and contradictions. It is the Quran that misunderstood and jumbled up the stories. We're told that Abraham was tested. We're told that the story of uh, Jacob is correct. We're told that the lineage from Abraham to Jacob to Isaac. We're told about the ark, that it flies to Saul. We're told about the temple. We're told about David and his conquest. We're told about uh, Solomon. We're told in Surah 7, for example, the story of Noah's accurate, Exodus, Babel, Lot. And so the problem here is that we have as sampling just from two surahs of gigantic portions of the Old Testament assumed, presupposed as accurate, as correct, as authentic. Now, many, many more examples can be given. I've got a whole list over here of all the Quranic references to the Old Testament. This is just a sampling. But what you didn't hear from him was a coherent epistemic principle for the arbitrary choices of how he knows when he goes to the Bible, which things are contradictions, which things are correct. And that's why it would have been better and more consistent if the Quran had purged itself of things like references to theophanies, references to God's Allah's presence uh, in their midst, in the midst of Abraham at the meal, or Allah's presence in the voice in the burning bush. Now, as he moved through his uh, statement, he said some really interesting things like that the Old Testament teaches polytheism. But the examples that he gave were examples that nobody would necessarily believe are polytheistic. They're just based on misinterpretations of the generic word God. And you'll notice that a lot of Islamic apologetics still hinges itself on a word concept fallacy, that the word divinity or God only has a single referent. It can only refer to God the Father or the divine essence and nothing else. But of course, throughout scripture, divinity can be referred to, to the demonic, to angels, to God to the divine essence, and to the divine nature. So only on the word concept fallacy can that be shown to be a contradiction. No, in fact, there are even discussions in the Quran and various commentators on the possibility of a divine council. That is God speaking to the angelic ministers. That's the phrase gods. It doesn't mean polytheism. It means angels and demons. Now, he goes on to talk about uh, Messiah, anointed one. He misunderstood that the meaning of anointed one comes from the liturgical ceremonies that anoint Aaron. So to say someone is an anointed one or Mashiach or Messiah, anointed one, does not entail that they're divine or the Messiah. There are many anointed ones. This is just a simple, basic grammar misunderstanding. Now, Orthodox Christianity perfectly explains the uh, Old Testament laws that he said were uh, unclear. Even in the Old Testament, it was, it was not the case that all of the ceremonial laws or the land laws were for the Gentiles. 
In fact, Orthodox Christianity itself preserves the meanings of these things. And I want to go back to the screen share here because uh, this was an important point, point that I didn't get to when I was going through my uh, last few slides there, which is that Islam does not have the things that he says it has, like priesthood and these elements. It has maybe loose similarities. There is no priesthood in Islam, and yet we are told in the uh, book of Melchiz in the book of Genesis, the story of Melchizedek, Genesis fourteen. We're told in the book of uh, uh, Second Peter that there is an eternal priesthood. Psalm one ten: You are a priest forever, according to order of Melchizedek. And so the phrase "anointed one" or Mashiach cannot be understood apart from the rest of the messianic prophecies that are there. Here's a board uh, I'll have for you here if you want to look at all of the different messianic prophecies and you can see that there's many of this is just a sampling so you can screenshot that and look at them later these messianic prophecies explain in totality the work and the meaning and the purpose of the coming in the life of the messiah so they're not uh random references they actually have a holistic context and meaning so let's go back to this we're told for example that the worship of jehovah when it's established at the temple, and you'll notice that picture of the temple there, you'll see a lot of things going on there. You'll see images, you'll see icons, you'll see vestments, you'll see incense. This everlasting priesthood is continued in the New Testament where the ministers are called priests after the order of Melchizedek. You'll notice that sacrificial worship and liturgy there of vestments, incense, iconography that we see in 1 Kings 4 through 8 are continued in Hebrews 13, 10 to 15, and Revelations chap Revelation chapters 4 through 6, where John sees into the heavenly worship, and he sees it as a liturgical ceremony. Thus, the church's worship, as we would expect, would have the heavenly worship on earth. It would be the fulfillment of the worship that Yahweh instituted there. And I would add that it's funny, because when you go to Islam, and you ask for or look for in the Quran an explanation of all of this liturgy, all this altar, all this sacrifice, all this stuff that is not there, right? Because what do we have? We have no temple. We have no priesthood. We have no altar. We have no sacrifice, no heavenly liturgy, thus no continuity. So all of, uh, of the arguments did not prove the very thing that he needs to prove. Okay. Thank you, James uh, and Jay. Um, so Jay wants to insist that we stick to the Old Testament as the basis for judging the religion of the prophets. In my opening, I, I said very clearly that we don't accept this. Muslims don't accept the Old Testament as an authority. And even amongst Christians, uh, different denominations accept different books of the old, as part of the Old Testament. Um, and even amongst the Jews, they have differences on what they consider to be the canon. So which Old Testament are we even talking about? The problem is that even if I concede that, OK, let's take the Old Testament as the basis for judging the religion of the prophets. That's not even enough for Jay. I have to also accept Jay's particular interpretation of the Old Testament, namely the interpretation of his particular church. So this is, I have to make double concession to even get close to the same page uh, with Jay. He has this kind of epistemic requirement on me. Um, Jay also doesn't seem to understand the concept of tahrif in the Quran and in Islam in general, because Islam uh, has always been clear on the fact that we don't take the Old Testament as a, an authority or think that it has been preserved. And there are many verses of the Quran that speak to this. So in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 75 through 79, do you believers expect them to be true to you, though a group of them would hear the word of Allah, then knowingly corrupt it after understanding it? And then it continues, um, and among them are the illiterate who know nothing about the scripture except lies, and so they wishfully speculate so woe to those who distort the scripture with their own hands, then say, this is from Allah. Okay, so, and then in the Quran, uh, Surah 3, verse 78, there are some among those who distort the book with their tongues to make you think this distortion is from the book, but is not what the book says. They say it is from Allah, but it is not from Allah. And so they attribute lies to Allah knowingly. So this uh, and, and other verses as well. So this is the concept of tahrif, and Muslims have always had a critical perspective on the scripture of the Jews and the Christians uh, from the earliest time of the Sahaba and the Salaf, but even later scholars, way before uh, biblical criticism became a thing within Europe, 
Muslim scholars like Ibn Hazm or Ibn Taymiyyah were arguing that the scriptures of the Jews and the Christians have been corrupted. And they did, they had all of this kind of historical critique uh, in their works, critiquing the scripture of the Jews and Christians. And this is over 500 years ago. So this is the concept of tahrif that I don't think that uh, Jay is familiar with. And, and we also find this concept of the scribes lying. Uh, this is also found in the Bible. So Jeremiah 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 8, is famous, how can you say we are wise for we have the law of the Lord when actually the lying pen of the scribes have handled it falsely? So th there are examples of this within the Bible itself. But the overall point is that tahrif is something that Jay does not seem to recognize. Now, um, he mentioned some of, uh, let me address some of the points in the opening. So uh, Boyerin. Okay, Boyerin doesn't say that the Old Testament theology is Trinitarian. Boyerin simply holds that there are multiple theologies, including ones that are not simple monotheism. So there's henotheism, there's bitheism, there's divine kingship. Boyerin, as an academic, doesn't say that, oh, yeah, the message of the Old Testament is Trinitarian. Um, also, Jewish scholarships that you mentioned acknowledges multiple theologies, including polytheism. Uh, modern Jewish scholarship does not claim that the Old Testament uniformly affirms Trinitarian theologies. And also, I noticed that when you were discussing Second Temple Judaism, you didn't mention pre-Second Temple Judaism, period. Uh, because in that period, there's clear polytheism being practiced, where they're talking about Yahweh as having a body and other deities in addition to Yahweh. So this is part of the uh, pre-Second Temple theology that we that academics write about. And you already referenced Boyerin, but you didn't represent uh, everything that Boyerin actually says. Um, let's see. Okay, you also mentioned that, again, you're using the Old Testament as the standard by which to judge the Quran. And that's the assumption of Gabriel Syed Reynolds that you uh, cited as well. His assumption is that the Quran is taking from other sources because he doesn't believe in the Quran, but that's an assumption on his part. And um, the fact of the matter is that the gospels that were available to the Arab Christians at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, they're not the Orthodox and Catholic version of the Bible anyway. So it doesn't make sense for you to uh, refer to them or appeal to that. These were the Syriac uh, texts of that time. So those wouldn't even match up with the um, the Septuagint or the Masoretic text that you that uh, people Christians use today. Um, let's see. Yeah, you said the Quran jumbles the message of the Old Testament. Well, the Old Testament is not a coherent message. It's it's jumbled already. So that's not really a knock against Islam. Um, yeah, so I would like to know if. Jay concedes that the Western academic scholars, uh, academics say that the Old Testament is, has polytheism. Part of the theology of the Old Testament is polytheism. And we can refer to Boyerin's statement. We can also, or book, we can also refer to Mark Smith, the origins of biblical monotheism. And they all say the same thing. Like there's polytheism in the Old Testament that's endorsed. And we see this also from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, so that's something that Jay should acknowledge. He mentions uh, Melchizedek. So that's like a small part of the Old Testament. It's not like this big deal. You're talking about uh, priests and this kind of priesthood. Well, in Islam, we have imams. We have imams who are teachers, who lead prayers. They lead liturgical prayers, communal prayers um, for the community. So that's something that we have in Islam. You want to say that's a loose connection? Well, what, who defines what is loose or what's not loose? And this is where seconds. Jay has to refer again to the church tradition to define that. But we don't accept the church tradition. So what give us an objective standard for deciding what is loose or what is not loose when it comes to comparing some of these aspects of Mosaic law with Islam versus what we see in Orthodox Christianity? That's the whole debate. Like, what is the objective standard? I'm going to ask Daniel a question because uh, Daniel never really responded to the actual argument that was given. The argument, first of all, was not that Boyorin is a Trinitarian. The argument was that Jewish scholarship admits 
differentiation in the Trinity. Those are two different things. So you misunderstood what I was saying. Um, also, uh, I'm fully aware that Jewish scholarship has all kinds of differing and liberal perspectives. My only point in all of that was just to say that it's not a monolithic thing. And so you can't argue from early Christianity or early Judaism at this time period that it was a monolithic Unitarian uh, uh, presentation. There's fluidity there. And so the point then is that, as uh, Boyarin says, Christianity represents a conservative early reading of Judaism, that meaning that a conservative reading of the existing text. My argument was more specific that the Quran itself assumes the validity of giant portions of the Old Testament. And I asked Daniel for his epistemic criteria to know when to pick and when to reject. And his response was, we go to the historically accurate presentation in the Quran. That's a circle. Explain to me how it's not a circle. I'll concede whatever else. Uh, sure. Uh, so I never said that I take the Old Testament. I'm not taking any portion of the Old Testament. I'm not uh, taking I any portion the Quran, of the Old The Quran's presentation, not you. Yeah, I accept the Quran, obviously, as a Muslim. I accept the Quran, not, you, you but I'm understand. not saying I'm not saying that, oh, I I think this or that portion of the Old Testament is correct and is from God, and another portion is not. What, I'm not. So that's not I, the argument that I'm making. Like, I, the, for example, I never. No, said I'm that. asking you to answer my argument. Yeah, I'm, I am answering it. So your you answered with that, that it's not the argument you're making. You, no, no, you no, answered you, with that it's not the argument you're making. I can't correct. Re, that's because restate, I'm making the argument. Restate, restate your. Claim the Quran presupposes large sections of the Bible to be correct. Where does it presuppose that? Here, in these examples. The examples that I listed for you previously. I can't read all of those. Oh, I'm sorry that you can't read it, but these, these are, are These are, Moses got scripture. What does that say? Moses got scripture. I read all like of these previously to you. Cloud so you, and manna. So like, what does that, that mean? You're saying that, the, you're saying that, you're saying that. You're saying that the Quran refers to like stories in the Bible that are found uh, in the That are prior, correct. Yeah, I, I acknowledge the Quran okay. has many so, biblical stories. So that doesn't mean that is, what is in the Bible, what is the in the Old Testament is, that you have is correct. criteria That's, that is so you can't answer this. So what is the? No, I did answer. Right? The, no, you, you don't understand. You don't understand it's the distinction question. that I'm making. No, you, you don't understand. understand. Gentlemen, all right, gentlemen, I hate to do this, now. but just because it has been two minutes, I gotta cut it back. Going over to Daniel for his two minutes, and then we'll kick it right back over to you, Jay, for yours. Yeah. So I accept the Quran, and of course, the Quran is mentioning things that are also found in the Old Testament. Your argument seems to be that because the Old Testament is older or the Hebrew Bible is older, that means it's more accurate or that is no. a more authentic text. No, so why should right. I expect why should I expect that the Quran uh, has to uh, conform to what the Bible says? Like, I don't have that assumption. Why would I? Why should I have that assumption? Because and I didn't Quran make makes it. No, the Quran doesn't make. It, where does the it, Quran say that the Old Testament is fully accurate? I didn't say anything about fully accurate. I'm giving all you you're showing our I'm giving the exam I'm giving guys, two sources. If you guys want to keep the two minute, if you guys want to try open dialogue, see, I'm totally he, open to that. No, I, I prefer the uh, two minute back and forth, but he keeps right because he, me he doesn't want to be pinned down. Wait, Reno. No, because we'll go, that's you don't why you didn't want we'll go to go You don't we'll understand the answer that I'm giving. Because it's not. Okay. So the, what you put on your whiteboard are just examples in the Quran that, oh, the Quran mentions Moses and it mo mentions Joseph and it mentions um, the garden. It mentions Adam and Eve. Therefore, this is the, the Quran is saying that the Old Testament is accurate. That doesn't follow. The Quran is giving a record independently of the Old Testament of what actually took place with the prophets, with the with revelation. My argument does is not contingent on the Quran. I'm saying that I don't take anything from the Old Testament as necessarily accurate in and of itself independently. Uh, I made that clear in my opening statement. The thing is that um, those parts of the Old Testament, even if assuming that they are accurate, even assuming that they are representative of the prophets, we could argue, we could hypothetically argue that Islam is more consistent with that than Christianity. That's the and argument. 
That's been two minutes. Go ahead, Jay, for two. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess there's kind of a, a lack of, uh, you know, understanding basic argumentation here because I understand that you don't accept the Old Testament. I'm well aware of that. I'm making a very specific argument that the Quran does not merely in passing mention these things. It, in fact, presupposes that entire stories and narratives are correct. And you admitted that those stories and narratives are older, correct? Yes, you said that. They're older. Now, I'm not saying they're true because they're older. I'm saying that this is your books, your authoritative books. This is just an example. We can go to other examples about uh, the burning bush, right, and these kinds of stories. I understand that you don't think that the Old Testament is authoritative. You don't have to repeat that to me. I'm making an internal critique. Apparently, I don't. you don't understand what an internal critique is because the book that you accept as authoritative presupposes not passing references, entire stories and narratives that are correct and uh, that are authentic because it says for the seventh century Jew or Christian, how else would we do it? We would go to the prior existing revelation. How else, if I'm a seventh century Jew or Christian, how else would I confirm what the Quran is saying if I don't go to the previous text like it says to do? So it's a very simple argument. And I'm asking you, how is it not circular for you? Because you're just saying, well, we, we know that the Quran is correct. The Quran is the epistemic principle for proving that the Old Testament is wrong and the Quran is correct. Don't you see that that's circular? Yeah, yeah so... so the Quran does presuppose that some of the things that are mentioned in the Old Testament are correct. Okay. Right. Um, What's your epistemic principle for when you know? I, to I have to keep it with the two minutes. Oh, I hate that. that was, I didn't. That was the format like my, uh, like the presentation and the argument that I gave wasn't to establish that the Quran is the word of God. That wasn't what I like the argument that I gave in this presentation. I, I'm the one who gave the internal critique. Because I'm not presupposed. What I said that the the Quran is preserved, and that is a matter of academic, objective fact. Uh, whereas when it comes to the Old Testament, yeah, the the Quran does say that parts of the uh, Old Testament are correct, but there's no full endorsement of the Old Testament. Now, if you did find me a verse that says that everything in the Torah and the Injil that the Christians and the Jews have is accurate, if you can find me that verse. Okay, then I'll say, yeah, you have a point there. That is a good internal critique, because then I would have no position to, to criticize the Old Testament. But there is no such verse like that. So there's no internal critique here. Um, the circularity is on your part. Like, go back to the argument on the preservation of the Quran versus preservation of the Bible. No academic is going to say that, oh, yeah, the, the uh, Bible that we read today has been preserved and this is coming from the prophets and there's been a change of chain of transmission. There's no academic that says that about the Bible, but you have plenty of academics. Uh, in fact, that's the consensus about the Quran. So that's an independent argument for why the Quran or why Islam preserves scripture, preserves teachings, norms, rituals, doctrine, whereas Christianity doesn't or hasn't. That, so th there's nothing that's circular about that. And time. Right. So in other words, a bunch of assertions. And again, I'm doing a specific critique, not that you think the Old Testament is infallible or correct, but that the Quran itself presupposes gigantic portions to be correct. I understand that you don't accept the other portions. That's why I specifically asked you for the epistemic principle that tells you when you go to the Old Testament, which things are true, which things are false. You then appeal to the fallacy of consensus was that there's a lot of scholars who, who, who agree with me. That's a fallacy of consensus. Did you know that's a fallacy? It doesn't prove anything. Now, maybe it's true. Maybe it's not true. That's why it's a fallacy. It doesn't follow necessarily from that argument that a bunch of scholars, I could find a bunch of scholars that do affirm the reliability of the New Testament. For example, Craig Blombard or uh, Blomberg or uh, F.F. Bruce. So there's plenty of scholars who admit the reliability of the Old and New Testament. You just simply wouldn't want those. And so you're picking and choosing the scholars. Again, how would a 7th century Jew or Christian know that the claims of the Quran, as they are newly presented at that time, what would they go to to verify that its claims are true? And you keep saying, the Quran is consistent. It's historical. Scholars like it. A lot of scholars don't like it. And those are fallacious arguments. Do you not understand what a fallacy is? 
Yeah, this, so the answer to your question, a 7th century Jew or Christian could see that Islam is consistent with the Old Testament or with whatever text that they had at, with them at the time. They would see that because Muhammad وسلم, is like Moses. That's how, that's how they would see that Islam is true, that the teachings of Muhammad are consistent with the teachings of Moses. That's, that's exactly but, you know, but you how they would said, know. You just said so, Moses was inconsistent. I have to, I have to keep with no, that. No, I did not say promise. Moses is inconsistent. You said, you I said, said the, that the Torah I had to do this, Jay, I did not say, I, to... I did not say that Moses was inconsistent. I said the Old Testament, a book uh, that has been distorted over time, as mentioned in the Quran, is inconsistent. The fact that the Quran doesn't, the fact that the Quran uh, affirms parts of the Old Testament does not mean that the Old Testament is uh, is infallible or hasn't been corrupted. Like I don't understand the logic here that you're using. I I acknowledge, I acknowledge from the beginning. Yes, in the Old Testament, you'll find stories that are affirmed in the Quran. That does not mean that everything in the Old Testament is considered to be correct according to the Quran. So what is the what is the contradiction? Like what is the internal critique? This uh, this is not making any sense to me. I'm sorry. And then again, I answered the, the basis for a seventh century Jew or Christian to know that the Quran and that and that Muhammad وسلم, is a prophet is because there is all this continuity with the teachings of Moses and the teachings of Muhammad. That's oh. how they would know. What are the teachings so, of Moses? You see, you just restated uh, there's, the there's very there's still thing 30 seconds. I hate yeah, to the, do this, but just because I teaching, promised. Yeah. So the teachings of Moses are found. As the Quran. No, no, the teach we can look at the Quran or the Jews themselves in the seventh century. They're not looking at the Quran. They're looking at the Old Testament. They're looking uh, at the oh, Hebrew well, Bible. You, they're looking at the Hebrew. They're looking at the Hebrew Bible. Exactly. Exactly. Which you just said is full of corruptions and errors. So and the your, seventh century Jew or Christian would answer, see that as well. The seventh answer, century. The seventh no, century Jew or Christian would also see the corruption. No, your also answer see is that your epistemic principle is that the Quran is true because the Jews or Christians could go to the books of Moses and see that it teaches what the Quran teaches, but the books of Moses are full of contradictions because of the Quran. You have a circle. I just you just said they go to the books of Moses. Yeah. They go to the books you just of Moses said, and they you see said it has, the con they you said see that the things has that confirm. Yeah, they see the they see the things oh, that confirm so Muhammad وسلم, and they don't see the things and they see the contradictions like the monotheism versus polytheism. They see the divine kingship. They see all of those things as well. All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick it over to Jay for two minutes, and then we'll kick it yeah. back over to Daniel. For so two as we can hear there with this absurdity. He said that they would go to the books of the Bible. They would go to the books of Moses, which is where we would get the teaching of Moses. As the Quran itself says, we gave them the books, the covenant, the scriptures. He's saying that the 7th century Jew or Christian would go to those texts to see if it's in continuity with the new revelation. But then he says that the new revelation is the principle for judging the other revelation. This is such a dumb argument. I can't believe that he can't see this because it's it's a circle. He's saying that they're going to see that the Quran's presentation is correct when they look at their authoritative texts, but you judge those authoritative texts on the Quran, the very thing that is in question. It is a very simple, circular argument, and that's why he keeps stating that, no, they just go to their text to see that the Quran is true. The Quran is the thing that's in question. Is it in continuity with the prior revelation? So Daniel's forced in the position of saying that the prior revelation is full of contradictions. It's full of inconsistencies, as he said, which I said in the, in the Horns of the Dilemma that he would have to do that. I'm well aware he doesn't think that the Old Testament is reliable, but his Quran relies on large portions of the prior revelation being reliable. That's the argument. That's the point. And then Daniel picks and chooses arbitrarily, ad hoc, based on his presupposition that the Quran is correct, which Old Testament things he likes and doesn't like. So I asked for an epistemic principle, and I heard fallacy of consensus. I heard because the Quran is historically reliable and because the Quran is true. That's a circle. You're misconstruing my statements. There are independent reasons to take the Quran as true. Well, let's put that aside. Like if you want to have the debate on whether the Quran is the word of God, 
that's a separate debate. And there are independent reasons that I can give for the Quran being true. That doesn't depend on the Quran itself. Once you have accepted the Quran as, as true, then you take it as a criteria. Okay, then you take it as a criteria. The Jews and the Christians in the seventh century, they're told by, uh, by Allah to check with their own scripture. And they'll see that Muhammad وسلم, is a true prophet. It, the Quran doesn't assume that, oh, you have to accept the Quran and then you, you judge the Old Testament. That's not the way, that's not what the Quran is saying. So you're misconstruing the argument, you're misconstruing the Quran. Once you have accepted the Quran as the revelation of God, yeah, then you take it as a criteria. But there are independent reasons to take the Quran as, um, as being from God. So this is a, there's, there's no circle here. Um, and also look at Deuteronomy 18.15 in the Septuagint. It reads, the Lord thy God shall raise up to thee a prophet of thy brethren. Uh, like me, him shall ye hear. Okay, this has been altered in the Masoretic text, which reads, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from a young, among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. So Muslims quote this passage as proof of the prophethood of Muhammad sallam, although we believe nonetheless that much of the Bible has been corrupted through this doctrine of tahrif, which you haven't given any indication that you know what tahrif even means. So to sum up, the 7th century Jew or Christian could decide to follow Islam based on parallels between Moses and Muhammad's message, prophecy in Deuteron Deuteronomy uh, of a prophet like Moses, their perception that Jewish and Christian doctrine has changed over time and is corrupted, so they'll see the contradictions within the, within the text themselves, their perception that the Bible is deeply contradict contradictory, and also miracles of Muhammad Wasallam. So these are all independent reasons for and that time. Jew or Christian to accept Islam. Yeah, exactly. So once you accept that it's true, you'll see that it's true. That was exactly my point. Daniel said that once you accept the Quran, you'll understand that the Quran is the superior revelation and that it's the, the thing by which we judge the past revelation. Now, Daniel said there's other independent arguments. I'm not concerned. I didn't answer or reply to what you called independent arguments other than to say that those were fallacies to just cite consensus of a uh, fallacy of consensus. I specifically address the specific claim that you said that a seventh century Christian or Jew could go to their text to see what the Muslim reading of those texts. That is what you said. You said that that Muhammad is like Moses, that, that there's some, some similarities and that, and that the Old Testament has contradictions. Those are arguments based on the presupposition that the Quran is true. That's the thing that's in question. That's why I keep asking you for an epistemic principle that isn't ad hoc, arbitrary, or circular, because every argument that you present is just a restatement of the Quranic position. And that's why you have to say, well, once you accept that it's true, you'll see that it's true. You see, that's a circle. So again, all this shows is just inconsistency and in that the prior revelation has to be cited and given some credence because they know that. Uh, they want to have continuity, and that's what this debate is ultimately about. But then when other things are brought in from prior revelation that are even assumed and mentioned in the Quran, like these uh, manifold examples of large narratives, the response is that those are the ones that we don't like and we don't accept those because they're problematic for our position. And then he just cited unbelieving scholars and so forth as if citing a, a consensus has anything to do with a debate. It doesn't matter. When I cited the Jews as scholars, that was just attestation to prove that it's not monolithic. It wasn't a proof, but Daniel seems to think that citing somebody makes it a proof, which is, again, a fallacy. So all of this just shows, again, inconsistency in his presentation. And time. We'll kick it over to Daniel. So, again, you're, you keep asserting that it's circularity. There's, there's no circularity. The Jew and the Christian in the 7th century or today they see similarities between Moses and Muhammad وسلم, with their eyes. They look at empirical data. They look at the historical record. These are people who are not assuming that the Quran is true. Then on the basis of those similarities, basis on an empirical, on empirical observation, using their reason, uh, using you know, their intuitions, then they come to accept that Muhammad وسلم, is a true prophet. This is, this is not circular. Um, 
So, yeah. And, and referring to academic consensus, again, I'm not just saying, oh, the academic consensus is what it is. And I, uh, I don't know what they're actually saying. The academic consensus is based on data. It's based on radiocarbon dating. It's based on um, paleograph paleographic data. It's based on inscriptions. It's based on all of this data that then the academics reach this consensus uh, about the Quran as opposed to uh, the Bible. So that this is not circular. It's not a fallacy. <laughs> Citing research is not fallacious. Unless you have a problem with the research, you can bring up that those problems. I'm happy to hear your critique uh, of the historical critical method. That's fine. Uh, but I mean, I want to ask you, what percentage of scholars at research universities and Ivy League schools, Jay, agree that the Old Testament and the New Testament have been accurately transmitted and are free from polytheism? Can you answer that question? Like, what is the percentage really of these Ivy League schools that consider the Old Testament and the New Testament to be accurately transmitted from the time of the prophets or the time of Jesus? And how many of, of them will say that the Old Testament is free from polytheism? Time for yours, Jay. Maybe if I draw a circle for you, it'll help because I can make it really easy. Because what you just said in your uh, comment there, he said, what's the epistemic principle? They'll go look at their text and find similarities. Similarities to what? To the Quran's presentation of who Muhammad is. That's a circle, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, you're laughing because I guess you just realized there's a circle behind you on the wall. Maybe that helps you understand how a circle goes. It goes from asking the question of epistemic principle. You said a similarity in their text to the Quran. So in other words, reading their texts according to the presupposition of the superiority of the Quran, when the Quran is the thing that's in question. That's a circle, Daniel. Now, in regard to, again, the consensus of percentage of scholars, what would that have to do with anything being true or false? You could have 99.9% .9 of scholars saying any number of things. What would that have to do with whether it's true or false? Now, maybe it's true, but you understand that this is a fallacy again. Now, if we surveyed what, evangelical scholars? Well, most of them are going to believe in the reliability of the text. But your survey would presumably not have those people. Also, by the way, in your Hashmi debate, you said, for example, that at about 37 minutes in, oh, uh, the historical critical method is perfect for deconstructing Judaism and Christianity. Oh, what about the other one? Oh, your position. Yeah, Islam. So are you really going to tell me that modern critical scholarship unanimously accepts the Quran as an authentic historic document? You know that's not true. That's ridiculous. No, they don't. You're, you're over there bobbing your head. Unbelieving scholars don't present that. Now, you could rely on some fallacies like, well, uh, it has some things that it presents, like uh, uh, Unitarianism. Well, so what? A lot of religions present Unitarianism. That doesn't prove or disprove anything. So you're just deflecting into topics to get away from the epistemic principle, which you just showed as a circle. And time. Can you explain? Daniel? Can you explain to me how it's not a circle? Yeah. If if I say something like, okay, yeah, just hold keep hold it up, Jay. Okay. So if I say that uh, Jay is living in a five story house, okay, I make that claim. And then I go and I explore, someone goes and explores Jay's house and says, oh, yep, that's a five-story house. Is that, is that a circular type of reasoning? He's just confirmed it with his eyes. A claim that is made in the Quran is then confirmed by people who are observing the world. Where is the circle? Like when you have a circle, just drawing arrows on a whiteboard doesn't make it a circle, Jay. Um, oh. And about the academic consensus, yes, it is a consensus. Yes, this, the, that's the point that I keep trying to make to you. The academic consensus is that the Quran has been preserved. They've radiocarbon dated the Quran to within the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and there And the academic consensus is that there is one author of this Quran. It's not dozens or hundreds of different authors and editors. That was a theory. That was a theory about the Quran, but it was refuted. It was debunked. How? Because they, the academic researchers found evidence 
They found all kinds of records. They did the radiocarbon data. They did research, empirical research, and they came to that consensus. That's that's not a circle, Jay. Um, so you mentioned my debate on the historical critical method. If you listen to the full debate, I said, yeah, Muslims can endorse the historical critical method and we can apply it to the Quran. The thing is that when we do apply the historical critical method to the Quran, it comes out on top. That's why as a Muslim, I want to endorse that methodology. I do want to endorse it, but you as a Christian cannot. You have to say that, oh, you can't ap appeal to consensus because, oh, that's a fallacy or that's a circle or some way to hand wave away the academic consensus. So go to Qur the Quran, a historical critical introduction by Nikolai Sinai. Go read that and... book and it'll explain that there's a consensus on the preservation of the Quran. Time. We'll kick it over to Jake. Yeah. So again, maybe Daniel's not familiar with uh, informal fallacies, but the appeal to consensus is a fallacy. Now, you might bring in the appeal to consensus to back up a claim or to demonstrate that there's evidences for a claim. It's not a proof. And so it really has nothing to do with the thing that we're debating today, because the debate is not about whether or not the Quran was written by one person. I could concede that it was, and I don't really have any opinion either way. That doesn't mean that it's true or that it has anything to do with being consistent with the religion of the prophets. So total irrelevance to the topic of the debate. And I'd like to go back to what you said as your answer to explain this with, you just see it with your eyes. Really, you think that's how epistemology works? Because I gave you your exact statements about the epistemic principle for how we know the continuity exists. And you said that the seventh century Jew Christian looks to see the similarities to what? To the Quran. And you just see it with your eyes. That's called circularity. And I'm surprised that you can't see this because this is just assuming that the thing that is in question is the case, that the Quran is correct and that the Quran has continuity with prior, prior revelation. And so you're just basically restating again that a seventh century Jew or Christian just simply goes to see in the books of Moses or in whatever, the, the Gospels, the principles of the Quran already there and anything else that's not consistent with the principle of the Quran, you arbitrarily toss away. And so that's why I keep asking you for the epistemic principle that isn't circular based on the presuppositions of the Quran's theology that lets them verify it. So you've already admitted that they go to their texts, but you said their texts are full of contradictions. On the basis of what? On the basis of what the Quran presents. But the Quran's presentation is what's in question. So you understand the burden of proof is on you with the new revelation to make it consistent with the prior revelation. That's the prior test in Deuteronomy 13 and 18. So you just keep restating again the position of the Quran. So I'm going to ask you again, how is you just see it uh, a resolution to the problem of circularity? And time, two minutes for Daniel. Oh, just like if the Bible makes a claim about something, like there are unicorns, we go uh, to the world and we see if that's the case or not. And then we determine if the Bible is correct or not. Same with the Quran. If the Quran made a claim that, you know, Moses was a, um, you know, a prophet who had wings and he could, he could fly or something like that. And we don't have any historical record of that. Or the Jews are Christian and Christians say, like, we don't have any concept of that. Then that would be evidence for them to say that, OK, well, this is not adding up. So we don't accept the Quran. But what has happened with a lot of Jews and Christians over history is that they see that the Quran is making claims that then they, as unbelievers, go and uh, look not only in scripture, they look to themselves, they look at their lives, they look at ayat, the signs of Allah. And then based on a, uh, uh, all of that evidence together, then they come to the conclusion that this is true or this is false. That's, that's not circular reasoning. So uh, the claim that, and this is why I presented in the opening statement, like these are all the similarities with, between Muhammad وسلم, and Moses. These are things can be, they can be confirmed or they can be denied. And you see a lot of parallels that confirm that similarity. And that becomes a non-circular reason to accept uh, the Quran um, and the claims of the Quran. We'll give it to so you, Jake, steps, two minutes. Oh, wait. Don't I have 30 seconds? If you if you still wanted that last. Yeah, yes. I still want the, the rest of it. So 7th so century Christian can notice contradictions in the Bible without relying on the Quran. 
Seventh century Christian can notice that doctrine changes over time without relying on the Quran. Seventh century Christian can notice that the Trinitarian concept is illogical and polytheistic without relying on the Quran. So there's nothing circular about any of those conclusions. And again, referring to academic consensus is not circular. It's not, I can't believe that you take references to academia as, as, as circular. I didn't say it was circular, so it's a fallacy. It's called the fallacy of consensus or the fallacy over, of We'll kick it over to Jay for the start of his two minutes. So I would like to point out that Daniel just said that appealing to the consensus is not a fallacy. So I would, uh, again, maybe you should brush up on basic fallacies. Appeal to consensus and appeal to authority is a fallacy. So I think, again, we're, we're, we're seeing some embarrassment here on the basics. But let's go back to this again, because when he restated himself about this uh, question, you just restate it again that well, you just go and look with your eyes to see what the question is about epistemic principle, not empirical data. So he's just restating a basic naive empiricist position. That's not going to solve the epistemic principle about how he knows or how a seventh century Jew or Christian knows that the Quran is the true way to read the Old Testament. That's the thing that he's doing. But I'm saying. Well, if I want to verify that the Quran is the new revelation that I'm supposed to follow, he said, go to Moses and you'll see what? Oh, contradictions. Contradictions on the basis of what? The teaching of the Quran. Well, then he said, no, no, no. Actually, there's other historical things that I could point to, like uh, the Trinity being illogical. Oh, you mean like how I could ask you the exact same problem of a dependence relationship between the attributes of Allah? How I could ask you the exact same problem of how Allah has two right hands and how he descends from the throne to the lower heavens, but he doesn't enter into creation. And those things are all metaphorical. Uh, there's a dependence relationship between the attributes. Oh, but also that's also, it's maybe something we just read literally and we don't go into the speculations because Daniel's a Salafi. Maybe he doesn't want to go into metaphysics. Oh no, he doesn't allow any of that for his stuff. He doesn't want you to know that, Oh, uh, the unity of Allah, which everybody's supposed to just appeal to and know as, Oh, this is so clear. Everybody believes this. Well, there's actually six different schools debating for centuries what the unity of Allah actually means. So he knows that it's not a simple, obvious thing. The dependence relationship between the attributes shows that his position is not immune to the very one and many problem that he's trying to throw on the, on the Trinity. And again, the prior revelation of Moses in the Torah is full of texts that have references to and multiplicity. Time. Yeah, so I mean, we can ask the same thing of Jay, you know, how would a Jew know that the New Testament is true or that the New Testament is transmitted accurately? How would how would a Jew know that? Like, on what basis could a Jew conclude that, oh, yeah, this New Testament is consistent with the Hebrew Bible? So we, we, actually, we actually have uh, hundreds of examples of the New Testament citing the Old Testament to demonstrate that continuity. For example, the how, many, would citing the, the how many, does citing the Old Testament confirm that the New Testament is correct? No, I, I could mean, just write, I could said, just write said, a how, revelation you, right the now. Debate is about I, could write, I could write a revelation to, right now. I have now. to jump in really quick just to give Daniel that two minutes uninterrupted. You know, uh, sorry, uh, go ahead and finish your thoughts. Yeah, 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 go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Well, the question was about how would a Jew or Christian know, know that the revelation of the New Testament is consistent? Well, the New Testament says in hundreds of places, here's where we're getting our argumentation. For example, Jesus in John 5 all the way through John 9 gives many, many examples of how he's the one that appeared at Mount Sinai. He's the one that spoke to Moses. He's the one that, uh, you know, was speaking and eating with Abraham. So these are the examples that are cited in the New Testament, not in every place, but in many places for continuity. That's what I'm getting at. So we have tremendous continuity, particularly in Orthodoxy. So a Jew would know that the New Testament is true because the New Testament. No, that's not what I said. Because you just, of, you just said you just said no. I said all the, these things. I in the said New the Testament. citations of the Old Testament. Did you, do, you, do you understand? Yeah, so that, the Jew would know. You know that are you not New, familiar with these texts? These are Jew, Old Testament. A Jew. Okay, so now two minutes, so, so, I, so I can make a point. Oh, uh, it's my time. You asked me. No, no, your time, James. Is it his time or my time? I thought he finished, and then I was going to start my time. If I'm, if I remember right, I think we're in Daniel's time, 
Yeah. But he asked Daniel, me you were sometimes asking no, no. questions to Jay. So Jay was obviously yeah. talking because he was right, responding. Go, go ahead, questions. Jay. Then once you're finished, I'll but have my turn. Yeah, so I didn't say that the New Testament cites the New Testament. I said that the New Testament argues consistently throughout all of the books about continuity with the Old Testament. That's crucial. That's why Jesus says that not one jot or one tittle will pass from the law until all these things are fulfilled. It's very crucial to our theology that the triad be in the Old Testament, and it is, and it's in these kinds of passages that I'm linking here. We'll kick it over to Jay, would now have his two minute uh, statement. Go ahead, Jay. <laughs> I, okay. Do I remember I see, right? Well, if was, you asked me a question as part of your time, I mean, I, if, if, yeah, that, if you want to ask another question. Unless I misunderstood, that was, I was under the impression that Daniel, during your time, you asked Jay a question, and then the reason Jay was talking was because he was answering your question. But if, if you want to ask another question, that's okay. No, I don't want to make a statement now based on the answer that you give. So the the question was, how does a Jew know that the New Testament is true? And your answer was, well, he, here are all the passages in the New Testament. <laughs> so the, the Jew or the Muslim or the pagan has to refer to the New Testament to know that the New Testament is true. That's a circle. <laughs> that That is the very definition of the circle. Uh, yeah, so he sees conformity. Oh, so he sees conformity between the New Testament and the Hebrew Bible. It, how is that any different than what I, I uh, was saying about the Quran? You, you're only cherry picking the passages in the Hebrew Bible that are consistent with the New Testament. There are plenty of passages that are inconsistent with the, with the uh, New Testament. So how is that not cherry picking, Jay? These, this seems like a very clear double standard. You have one standard for the Quran and you have another standard for the New Testament. Explain that. The Trinity is not consistent with the monotheistic parts of the Old Testament. This is what the Boyerin that you're citing or Mark Smith that I cited. They're, they're the ones who are saying that there is no consistent theology in the Old Testament. There's no consistent theology in the Old Testament. You don't take them as experts. That's fine. You just want to refer to the church, the authority of the church. You want to refer to the authority of the New Testament. That's what's the circle, Jay. I'm willing to cite outside authorities, non-Muslim authorities. And it's not a fallacy because I'm citing their actual research. We can go through the research. You want to read Nikolai Sinai? And we can see his conclusions. I can show you his argumentation for why the Quran is preserved. I'm not just saying, I'm not presenting a deductive argument here <laughs> so, such that, oh, citing academic consensus is a, is a fallacy. No, it's not. It's evidence for a position in, an, in a broader argument, not a deductive argument. So this is not a fallacy. You're not able to cite any kind of academic source. I asked you about what is really the consensus on the New Testament and the Old Testament being preserved within academia. What do, what do the experts say, Jay, about textual preservation? You just conveniently avoided that question and you want to and... set standards for Islam that you don't have for yourself. Yeah, so again, Daniel, I did not say that a person goes to the New Testament to see if the New Testament is true. I said that in the question of continuity with the Old Testament, the New Testament argues from the, these are Old Testament passages, Daniel. Do you understand that's what I'm saying? Today's debate is about continuity. These are Old Testament passages about theophanies. Many of those theophanies, such as Judges 13, Judges 6, Ezekiel 1 to 10, Zechariah 1 to 3, they're specifically messianic in nature. They're about the coming of the Messiah and what he would do. So you restated twice incorrectly that I was claiming that the New Testament proves the New Testament. No, you ask about continuity with the Hebrew Bible, and I'm saying that the New Testament cites the Messianic prophecies and cites the Theophanies as proof for the continuity. That's what I argued the whole time, that our position is in continuity with the Hebrew Bible. It doesn't matter to me that unbelieving Jewish scholars think that there's multiple different theologies in the Old Testament. That's not my position. My position is that the Old Testament is consistent. There is a consistent triadic position. That's what I've argued the whole time. You did appeal to the consensus of authorities and scholars as if that proved your argument, and then you scaled it back just now to say, well, it's just kind of like an evidence. And I didn't ignore you. I cited two evangelical scholars, F.F. F. Bruce, Craig Blomberg. They believe in the reliability of the transmission of the text, but you don't accept them. And so it really doesn't matter because we can throw out scholars all day long of people that do and don't accept. You're just not going to accept any of the evangelical scholars or Orthodox or Catholic or whoever that do believe in the, the, the veracity 
and the authenticity of the Old Testament and New Testament texts. In fact, according to F.F. F. Bruce, the New Testament texts have over 5,000 early manuscripts with attestation to their 98 to 99% veracity, which is far higher than any other ancient text, including the writings of Plato, which the latest are the Middle Ages. So in reality, no, I, I answered all of your objections. I specifically argued for continuity and on the basis of the text. Yeah, yeah, where is the proof? Show me the proof of transmission of the Pentateuch from Moses. Like, where is the proof of that transmission? Uh, I don't think even any evangelical Christian scholar is going to claim that the Pentateuch has been preserved uh, or any other parts of the Hebrew Bible from Moses or from the prophets. Okay, so well, where are the where are the actual radio di carbon dated texts? Where are the inscriptions? Your argument about consistency, well, and you you show the different verses uh, on the board that are consistent with the New Testament. Okay, this is exactly the kind of argument that I presented in the opening statement. There's all kinds of things that are consistent between the Quran and what we find in the Hebrew Bible. So what? You know what does what does that actually no. prove? Um, and and the second point that you want to that you should not ignore and no Christian should ignore is that okay which version of the Hebrew Bible are we talking about? Are we talking about the Masoretic text? Are we talking about the Septuagint? Are we talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls? Are we talking about the Samaritan Pentateuch? Are we talking about the Peshitta? Are we talking about the Targumim? Which version? Right? These are all very different versions. The Jews themselves do not agree on what is canon. They have canon and they have apocrypha, texts and books that they don't don't accept. And between Catholics and Orthodox and Protestants and Coptics and all these different denominations of Christianity, there's not agreement on what the books of the Old Testament actually consist of. There's wide, there's entire books that are not included in the canon of some denominations. So when you hold up your chart, that really doesn't tell us anything because you have all of this variation in the books of the Bible. That kind of variation is not an issue with the Quran because again, go read Nikolai Sinai, go read Marin van Putin, go read any of these academics. It's the consensus. People can take my word for it or not. Go read these texts and they'll they'll cite, okay, this is the research and the consensus position on the Quran. Where does the Quran come from? Do you think there's a consensus about Abraham Lincoln and what Abraham Lincoln's thoughts and beliefs were academically or Julius Caesar? Yeah, there's going to be some variation, but there's going to be on the core beliefs of Abraham Lincoln, Julius Caesar, George Washington, any historical figure, you can have a consensus because there's actual empirical data that you cite and you do the research and determine that. That's the case also. That's the case also with the Quran and, and with Muhammad Sallallahu Not the case with the Bible. Time. Yeah, I mean, there's one glaring obvious thing that Daniel's not getting, which is that our position argues that the Old Testament is not full of contradictions and it is divine revelation. Because, of course, that's partly what it claims for itself. And that's part of the presupposition of continuity. Daniel's position is very different. It argues that there's not continuity with the things that he doesn't like in the Old Testament. I didn't do that. I don't have a ad hoc, I throw out elements of the Old Testament I don't like. The Orthodox Christian interpretation of the Trinity, again, is arguing that it is in the Old Testament. It is in the Torah. It's in the Pentateuch. That's the reconciliation, that explanation for the text that Daniel just doesn't like and doesn't want. That's why I keep asking about the epistemic principle, which we've seen throughout the whole debate is just him reasserting and reaffirming the Quran's presupposition. So when he talks about uh, the fact that people disagree amongst Christianity, again, Daniel, you should have reviewed fallacies because the number of people that disagree or agree amongst varying groups, guess what? That has nothing to do with the truth or falsity of any position. It doesn't matter how many people in the world disagree or debate or question, for example, that two plus two is four. It wouldn't matter. It has nothing to do with whether two plus two is four. So you keep bringing up things that are red herrings and fallacies that have nothing to do with the question of the debate, which is who's in continuity with prior revelation, with the prophets. And when we ask, how do we identify an Old Testament prophet over and over? You say, well, you just go and look and you see that it's the Quran's presentation that is the true prophet. You read the Old Testament through the eyes of the Quran and you will see the Quran is true. That's a circle, Daniel. That's why every time I ask you for an epistemic principle. You say, well, you have the same problem. You got this and you got to do this. No, but I don't have the problem because I don't believe that prior revelation contradicts Daniel. But you do. That's why you're in a completely impossible position.
you're saying that oh we just don't unlike muslims we just we don't just throw out whatever we don't like yes you do <laughs> the church rejects apocrypha the church rejects certain books and other denominations accept those books so your church literally the throws hebrew out bible, what you right? the hebrew yeah the bible. hebrew bible yeah the hebrew bible you don't throw has out the hebrew bible I have to you, keep it with that two minute okay. promise. So let, let me it's let me pull. Totally up. irrelevant. He's talking about something that's not what, what is, he's arguing against some other position. I'm not I'm a Muslim. To, I, I, I'll give you a chance to respond. Okay. So let's see. What does what do we throw out of the Orthodox or the Hebrew Bible? There, there is apocrypha. So no, the Hebrew Bible. Books of Ezra, for example. I've got uh, those Daniel, the the full two minutes. So I'm going to put you on mute, but I promise to give you a chance to respond. And right, let me let me pull that up. Just give me a second. But let me just address uh, the other statement that you made. Like you are, th there are many things in the Old Testament that Christians do not accept. You don't accept the Mosaic Law. Many of the practices within Mosaic Law, you throw out. Okay, so this is ex why because they're not consistent with the New Testament, and you will you will refer to the authority of the church and how you interpret the Old Testament. So how is that any different? You're referring to the authority of the New Testament in order to x out, nix, throw out uh, different parts of the Mosaic Law, circumcision, polygyny, uh, having multiple wives. These are the things that you're throwing out um from the old testament and if i and then you can give me like a elaborate explanation for why uh those things should be thrown out but again you you have to refer to your own doctrines of the church in order to do that so how is this any different jay you're not explaining the difference the distinguishing thing between what i presented in my opening statement with uh, as opposed to what you're presenting is that i did refer to an outside authority yeah, well, an even stronger argument would be an internal critique of your ultimate authority, which was the Quran and its inconsistency in your arbitrary ad hoc approach to the Old Testament. So that's an even stronger argument than an empirical external authority. Uh, and no, I, I, again, you were incorrect that we throw out elements of the Hebrew Bible. You referenced Ezra. No, those are all in the Orthodox Bible. We don't throw those things out. So you're completely false about wrong about that. Um, now, when it comes to uh, the ceremonial law, we do keep those things. Maybe you didn't know that, but in the New Testament, Paul, for example, cites how those things are kept for Christians. They're kept, spiritually speaking, because something like, for example, not sowing two seeds in a field or not sowing two patches on a cloth, the real meaning, Paul and Jesus argue, was the spiritual meaning. That was always the case. And the ceremonial laws were always meant just for the Jews. That's Jewish theology. The ceremonial laws are not meant for all of the nations. They're only meant for the Jews. So, in fact, we're perfectly consistent with how we approach the Old Testament. And I will refer you again to the arguments that I made in my screen share here, where you'll notice in the uh, Orthodox Church, we have a temple, we have a sacrifice, we have an altar, we have a priesthood, we have icons, we have heaven on earth, that you see on the right side of those things, just like you see on the left side of those things from the Old Testament. You don't have those things. You're an iconoclastic religion. You believe in the uh, absolute transcendence of Allah. And so Allah is not knowable. You can't predicate of Allah because he's not at all like creatures, although you believe that Allah has hands and somehow he descends into the lower parts of, uh, to the lower heavens, which is the creation. So you can explain to me how he does that, even though there's no spatial location for Allah. And when you said that we have a imams that pray, that's not what a priest is. A priest offers sacrifice by definition. You do not have sacrifice in your religion. Your religion is premised on there not being sacrifice. So it is incorrect to imply that you have continuity and consistency with the Old Testament on the basis of priesthood. And yeah, so there's no you've given no reason, there's no principled basis for which laws and which things within the Old Testament are meant for Jews and which are meant for all people, which are meant for Gentiles. What is the principle? I asked you, like you you say the real meaning is the spiritual meaning. This is exactly what I said. Like you're reinterpreting what the real meaning of the Old Testament is based on your church doctrine. The real meaning is not there in the text. You have to infer that or you have to use some kind of typological interpretation on the basis of the church. The uh, academic scholars, Muslims, Hindus, pagans, anyone else is going to read those same verses and not take that typological uh, meaning that you, or interpretation that you give it. That interpretation is on the basis or it presupposes the authority and the interpretation of the church. 
That's that's the problem with all of your arguments, Jay. And then the thing about Islam doesn't have sacrifice. Yes, we do. We have all kinds of animal sacrifice. Eid al-Adha. Have you heard of Eid al-Adha? Have you heard of the Aqiqa when a new child is born? Have you heard of all of these kinds of animal sacrifices that take place in Islam? That's animal sacrifice. How is that not consistent with the animal sacrifice uh, within the Old Testament? Um, also temple, we have mosques, we have litur liturgical prayers, we have uh, animal sacrifice, priesthood, like this concept, like this is all parallels, but you cherry pick. You say that, no, 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 that's not really similar to the Old Testament. What we have is the spiritual meaning, and that's similar to the Old Testament. Don't you see how that's, this is all comes off as post hoc? This, this all comes off as just on the basis of what the church says, we find these similarities with Christianity and the Old Testament, but Islam is not similar. Like this is where, what is the objective basis for determining that Christianity is taking more or is more similar to these practices in the Old Testament as opposed to Islam? Yeah, so again, I didn't say that you didn't have animal sacrifice. I said that you didn't have a priestly sacrifice. And you also were incorrect when you said that Melchizedek doesn't really have a significance in the Old Testament. He's only in Genesis 14. No, he's mentioned in Psalm 110 about the Messiah. And then when the Messiah comes, his priesthood is forever according to the order of Melchizedek. It's an eternal priesthood. So the animal sacrifices have a significance that is intimately bound up with the actual priesthood in the Old and New Testament. It's an eternal priesthood that offers sacrifice. And you, you know very well that your religion does, even though it has something like that, that doesn't mean it has the same significance. I'm not arguing that there's no, no similarities at all between Islam and Christianity and Judaism. Of course, you're gonna have uh, similarities because Islam, I think is again, a patchwork of Jewish tradition, uh, Haggadah, uh, Nestorian philosophy and theology and Christian stories as well. It's all of those things mixed together. And that's why it relies on things like the Proto-Evangelium of James and the account of Mary in uh, the Quran, for example. But no, I made a very specific argument that temple, sacrifice, altar, and priesthood are essential elements of biblical Hebraic theology, which Christianity has. And if you want to talk about how do we know which principles carry over and which ones don't, well, guess what? That's already in the Old Testament. It's already in the Old Testament that the ceremonial laws, the Mosaic commandments, they're for Israelites, they're for Israel. They're not even for the Gentile nations. Jews still believe this, right? Now, the specific, how would we know, that controversy already arose. And if Christ is the fulfillment of the law, which I would argue that he is, he is the Messiah, then he has the authority to say in what way and in how the Gentiles will or will not be bound to certain ceremonial things. There's a council that happened in Acts 15 to discover and decide this very issue. And that issue decided on the basis of what? Arbitrary? No. The covenant with Noah, which, by the way, your Quran affirms that the story of Noah and is correct. time. Yeah, I mean, this is like you're, you're saying that, okay, the temple, the sacrifice, the icons, the priesthood, the liturgical prayers, these are not just for the Jews. Okay, that's, that's what you're saying. Everything else... That's mentioned in Mosaic law. That's that's for the Jews. All the things that Islam is is continuous with. That's those are for those are just for the Jews. But when it comes to these particular things, that actually is not just for the Jews. Those parts of the law that those are things that we actually are applying. And then when I give you when and then you justify this by saying, oh, we have councils that tell us this fact. So that's circular, Jay. You're just a, appealing to the authority of your church. I don't accept your church, Jay. I don't. And most Christians don't accept your church either. Why should so the only justification that you have, the only principle that you're giving me is well, our councils decided this. Our councils determined that these aspects of the Old Testament are meant for not just Jews, they're meant for Gentiles as well. That's the circle that I presented in my opening statement. And you're just falling exactly into the pattern that I uh, spelled out and predicted in the opening. So, yeah, give me a principle outside of your church's authority why certain rules in the Old Testament part of the mosaic law are only for jews and others hear? are for gentiles yeah i heard you say that no, I, our church said first, that we had councils no, the first, and the council that not, determined no, it. that's what that i heard you say oh, sec, i do want to just sec, i do want to give uh, that last 30 seconds to daniel yeah I, I heard what you said jay you said the council is the one that determines that you didn't give me an independent reason so go ahead, kick Tom. it over jay. yeah i gave ahead, two jay. arguments 
you address the second argument. The first argument was that Jews themselves have their own principle and criteria for what the Mosaic law was about and who it was for. That was the first argument, which you blew past and ignored. And you said, oh, you're just saying it's your council and your church and your tradition. No, you asked a specific question about how is it consistent? And I'm saying, well, it's consistent, number one, with the principle that Jewish theology never considered the ceremonial laws for all the nations. It's for Israel, obviously, because so many of those laws are about the temple, which can only be in Jerusalem. Now, I have another question I want to ask you, which is, what is the significance of the temple and all of those liturgical ceremonies that are in the Torah in your religion, given the fact that many of these texts specify that it's an eternal covenant, an eternal priesthood? That's what I'm arguing, you see, and that's how Christianity has continuity. Jews don't have that because when they lost the temple, no more animal sacrifices, no more temple. 70 AD is the sign, according to Genesis 49 and Daniel 9, that the coming of the Messiah has appeared. My Messiah appears, we have the removal of the temple. That happened in 70 AD, as Jesus says in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. Now, if you're in continuity, I want to know where is the eternal priesthood? Where is the altar? Because you mentioned sacrifice. You mentioned prayers led by imams, but you know that's not what a priest is. Uh, so the format says uh, five minute closing. Oh, you're right. Sorry about that. All right, we do indeed have five minute closings, and then we're going to go into the Q and A, folks. So we're going to first kick it over to Jay for his closing. Thank you very much, Jay, for that reminder as well. And the floor is all yours. Right. So we saw quite a few times throughout this debate that Daniel committed multiple fallacies. When uh, those became evident, he then reformulated and re refitted the argument to try to throw it upon me to be internally consistent with my presentation. And then he said things like, most Christians don't have your view. No, in fact, most Christians do believe that the Old Testament and the ceremonial approach that we have as Orthodox is consistent, given the fact that the Roman Catholic Church would agree with this uh, as well. So the fact that he said most Christians don't have your view is just patently false. Uh, furthermore, Daniel cited uh, texts like Deuteronomy 18 as if that was about Muhammad, which is laughable because the text actually says, "We will, I will raise up somebody from among your brethren. That means a Jew, and Muhammad is not a Jew. So uh, this is creative interpretation that Daniel utilizes. By the way, how does Daniel not know that that text in Deuteronomy 18 isn't corrupted? Unless that text is cited in the Quran, and maybe he thinks it is, but again, we're back at that problem of, no epistemic criteria that was consistent other than that the Quran is just simply the, the correct religion and what's true, and we should accept that. But the question is about how do we know and recognize what the religion of the prophets is? Now, when I gave a, a list of things like temple, sacrifice, altar, priesthood, icon, et cetera, et cetera, incense, vestments, and so forth, uh, Daniel said, well, we got a few of those things, and so some of it's uh, kind of similar. So see, no, no, the argument was all of those things and the meaning of those things. It wasn't just listing similarities. And Daniel's whole argumentation this whole time has been, well, there's some similarities between uh, the Old Testament and Islam, but, but not any of the multitudes of dozens of passages that I arbitrarily say are corrupted and not true. And by the way, let me pull in uh, unbelieving academic scholars who he knows don't follow the Quran. It is simply not true that unbelieving higher textual crit critical scholars in some majority consensus affirm the accuracy of the Quran. It's just not true. Now, they might affirm something like it was written by or recorded by a single person. That has nothing to do with whether it's true or not. And by the way, the fact that the Bible is a bunch of different books over, over time has nothing to do with whether it's true or false either. Daniel's just assuming that it can't be preserved or that it's not preserved providentially by the fact that there's a bunch of authors. But that has nothing to do with whether or not it is or isn't accurate and historical. Furthermore, Daniel argued throughout the presentation that his, his view was not circular. And I want to stress again that it absolutely was circular because over and over we had requests. I don't know if I saw my, my board here to remind you that the requests were specifically about the epistemic principle for how he knows or how any 7th century Jew or Christian could know that the teaching of the Quran is correct prophecy. Prior revelation in Deuteronomy 13 and 18, as we saw, specified that it would be consistent with prior revelation. But Daniel's now saying that, no, there is no consistent prior revelation. So the very thing that he said that Christians and Jews could appeal to, Mosaic, Torah, 
prophets, in Jeel, he says, only if it's consistent with the similarities to the Quranic presentation. In other words, the epistemic principle is the Quran, by which we know that the Quran is the true revelation of the prophets. But it's not. And when Daniel's pressed on the issue, he just restates things like, well, you just go look with your eyes. This is completely naive when it comes to epistemology. I could just say the same thing. Well, I just go look with my eyes that it's not. You see how this doesn't resolve anything, and it's not an answer to the epistemic question. It's just restating the position over and over and over. And then when he says it's not a circle, ironically, he just rephrases what it means to go look with your eyes and to see. So we never got an answer to that. We never got a presentation about the actual meaning of the consistency of those texts. And when he asked me, how is your view consistent with the Old Testament? I start to give answers of consistency, and he says, well, uh, you know, most Christians don't believe that. No, actually, most Christians do believe that. Protestants are in the minority. Orthodox and Roman Catholics do constitute the majority and do agree with the transmission of these principles of, let's go back to it, temple, sacrifice, altar, priesthood, icon, incense, vestments. We can include them as a package deal. Now, Daniel says, but you don't have a consistent way to present uh, how you follow and don't follow the Old Testament. I gave a consistent presentation. I said, well, first of all, in the Jewish theology itself, not all of those things are for the Gentiles. So that's that's not me saying that it's true because you said it. I'm just saying that that's one argument from older theology. The question then about the New Testament is who's in continuity with that? And that seconds. continuity... What? About 20 seconds. Okay, that continuity is proven by the con the meaning being consistent over time of temple, sacrifice, altar, priesthood, icon, liturgy, incense, etc. And Daniel does not have those things, and he knows that. And so he's citing loose similarities to prove continuity when, as we saw, it's not, it's all arbitrary, and he rejects giant and portions of the Old Testament. Time. We'll kick it over to Daniel for his five-minute closing as well. The floor is all yours, Daniel. Yeah, so the point that... Um, uh, from Deuteronomy 18, the Lord thy God shall raise up to thee a prophet of thy bed brethren. Yeah, Muhammad is a descendant of Ismail and Abraham. So he is the brethren of, of Moses and of Jesus you. and all of the prophets. So that is, uh, he is of the brethren uh, of those prior prophets. By that argument, um, my sir, brethren. So can I get that time back? <laughs> Uh, so uh, yes, Islam has indeed. far more similarities with the Mosaic law than Christianity. Um, the only way that Jay denies this is through a post hoc reasoning by appealing to the church. Um, when I say that most Christians don't accept your position, I just meant that most Christians are not Orthodox. So many of the interpretations um, that the Orthodox give to the New Testament and the requirements of certain rituals um, and the requirement of certain kinds of liturgical prayers, that's not accepted by the majority of Christians. You have Protestants who disagree and you have Catholics who disagree on the details. Um, that's the only point that I was making. Um, let's see. Yeah, so overall, the entire argument that I mentioned from the beginning is that I started with the question of, should we look at the Old Testament to determine what the religion of the prophets are? Or should we look at the Quran? And Jay completely ignored that. And he just insists or he just presupposes that, of course, we're going to use the Bible to determine the religion of the prophets. Uh, but that's something that I don't accept. You didn't establish why the Old Testament is the source of information about the prophets, the definitive source of information. You didn't establish that in the debate. I only for the sake of argument uh, said, OK, sure, fine. Let's look at the Old Testament as if it is the, the definitive source on the prophets, even though Muslims don't necessarily accept that. Um, and even then, when we do so, we see that the, uh, there's all kinds of similarities between Islam, the Sharia, Mosaic law, the teaching and practice of Moses. Look at the uh, theocracy that is established by Mosaic law. Look at the imperial conquest that's established by Mosaic law. Look at... Um, Look at all of the uh, rituals regarding animal sacrifice. Look at all the rituals involving purification. Look at all the rituals involving pilgr pilgrimage. 
and on and on. Look at the norms. Look at the prohibition on certain kinds of sexual behaviors and the punishment that is prescribed for those sexual behaviors. Look at the prohibition of usury. Look at polygyny. Look at having multiple wives. Look at the dietary restrictions. All of these are major similarities between Islam and Mosaic law. What does Jay do exactly as I predicted? He just hand waves and says, no, 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 those aren't real similarities. These are the real similarities. And that's why he kept emphasizing over and over again, the icons, the temple, the priesthood, et cetera, et cetera. But my whole question, which he did not address, is give me a principled reason why those are actual similarities between Christianity and the Hebrew Bible versus uh, Islam similarities. The only thing he could do is give a kind of typological interpretation based on church teaching and ter- church tradition and these councils. So that's why I said at the very uh, beginning uh, that we can't have a debate just on what is the similarity on the basis of the Hebrew Bible, on the basis of the Old Testament. We have to have arguments beyond that. Jay did not provide any argument beyond references his uh, biased interpretation of the Hebrew Bible. He didn't provide a single argument outside of that. Whereas I did give an argument. I said that, look, the Quran has a track record of being a preserved text. And this is attested to by non-Muslims. Now, my argument wasn't as simple as like, okay, there's a consensus on the Quran being preserved. Therefore, it's preserved. No, I said that this consensus, we can investigate it. We can analyze it. We can look at what kind of uh, explanation and evidence is are brought by the academic researchers to say that the Quran is can be radiocarbon dated to the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and it's been preserved, and the Qur'a'at, like the different modes of reading the Quran have also been preserved. That is all things that non-Muslims in academia uh, will claim based on their research and based on their evidence. And I cited several works, Nikolai Sinai, Marin Van Putin, and others. So this is something that is independent of the Quran. It's independent of the Islamic tradition that I can cite to show that Islam has a track record of preserving religion. Jay uh, could not provide that because that does not exist. There isn't a uh, preserved version of the Pentateuch that can be traced back to 1300 BC or 2000 BC. There isn't a version of the Gospels that can be radiocarbon dated to within the first two centuries of Christianity, a complete uh, manuscript of the Gospels, let alone the rest of the New Testament. So there, there is no actual independent evidence of that. Um, and I asked Jay to provide any, and he, he couldn't respond. So this is this this is the actual difference between our positions. This is the actual difference and? between Islam and Christianity, and that's what my whole argument was based on. But I didn't get a response to any of those claims. Time orthodoxy is the true religion. How could orthodoxy have lost Constantinople to Muslims at its apogee? Apogee. Well, I mean, we don't measure the truth of the religion on the basis of who has worldly or temporal success. If we did, uh, we might be papists and we would think that it's true because, uh, you know, the Vatican Bank has a lot of money or something like that. So those are ridiculous arguments for truth or falsehood. I mean, I could point out Muslim losses of uh, battles. Would that have anything to do with whether Islam is true or false? No, it wouldn't. You'd also point out that um, when Constantinople fell, it was actually Uniate. So it it had become uh, in union with the papacy. So, I mean, Perhaps that's why it fell. I mean, there's a lot of different ways that this argument can be fleshed out, but none of that has anything to do with whether uh, orthodoxy is true or false. Yeah, and like I said uh, when I was responding in the debate, the idea that the term L, uh, which just means divinity, just like the word God, is a generic term. It's not a proper noun. So a lot of Daniel's arguments were based on word concept fallacies that God or L or whatever is a proper noun, then it's simply not. It can pick out different things. Also, I mean, everything that he was saying, too, about, you know, historic sources and radiocarbon dating and all this kind of stuff as the way that we would identify the Quran. None of that was available in the seventh century. So none of that had anything to do with how we would determine the true revelation versus the one influenced by paganism. And again, it's just assuming that there's no differentiation in Yahweh to say that that's therefore paganism. Well, maybe there is differentiation in Yahweh and it's not paganism. Reconcile, turn the other cheek. With DARPA and World War One and World War Two, as well as the Crusades. 
I mean, how would the existence of DARPA and World War One have anything to do with turn the other cheek? I mean, turn the other cheek is about uh, Jesus saying that you don't have the right as an individual to take vengeance. It has nothing to do with whether or not there are law courts or whether or not there can be uh, self-defense and warfare, which orthodoxy does hold to, and also holds to theocracy too, by the way, which is something I always argue for in regard to what Daniel was saying. You got it. This one from this one from Elorante says, J epistemic principle is radical monotheism. Back to Jews, but without supremacy. Remove Roman shenanigans after Council of Nicaea. You are welcome. I mean, you could go, uh, it would take you about five minutes to find a patristic citations from the first, second, and third century prior to Nicaea that teach the deity of Christ, that teach the deity of the Holy Spirit. Again, it would take you about five minutes if you wanted to look through. Uh, I mean, there's uh, Ignatius of Antioch, Justin Martyr, Theophilus, Didache, Irenaeus. They all talk about the full deity. Uh, there's distinctions in the in the Godhead. Um, and we saw Daniel, for example, cite uh, Justin and Irenaeus, but he didn't understand that those distinctions had to do with the human knowledge of God, how we distinguish God. It didn't mean that there's different minds in God. Religion is who one worships. Not only is the Trinity a paradox, but Christianity isn't even clear on who or what God is. Yeah, it's completely not true. Every Orthodox uh, church in the world confesses that we believe in a monarchical Trinitarianism. Uh, the Nicene Creed says, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And then it says, God from God, light from light in regard to the Son and into the, in regard to the Holy Spirit. That's in the original Nicene Creed as well. So, no, I mean, you might disagree with that, but whether or not uh, Orthodox Christianity clearly teaches that is not, it, it absolutely does teach that everywhere. It says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a good claim. Uh, but then when you see uh, the text I cited, like Jeremiah, 8.8, 8, or even Kings, like, let me read you these passages. Um, hold on. <laughs> Well, how does how do you know that Jeremiah is not corrupted there? Yeah, I mean that's a question for I can assume that it's corrupted, but a Christian who's well, then, citing it, a Christian who is citing it is going to be. Well, uh, but you're not a Christian citing in, it. Exactly. So this is a problem yeah, so for the Christian. This is a problem it's, for the it's Christian. A problem for so you because when the Christian you, says, "Look, when the when Jeremiah eight a says, how can you say we are wise for we have the law of the Lord when actually the lying pen of the scribes has handled it falsely?" Yeah, you just assume that's about so the that's. Fact. Yeah, so this is an example of um, ass assuming, or this is a claim that the text oh, has been corrupted yeah, because the scribes are the ones who are writing down the scripture. So Wait, you're citing a, a to... potentially corrupted text to prove the texts are corrupted. Yeah, this is an internal contradiction for the Bible because Second Timothy no, it's only an three sixteen no, it's says all Scripture is God breathed and Correct. is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. Yeah, right. Jeremiah. So this is about, a on the, plain reading, about on the plain reading. On the plain reading, this he's is a contradiction. About yeah, you can. Teaching. Yeah, you, you're telling me what he's talking about, but that's so not what you. the text actually says. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just going by the plain text reading. Texts don't work. I'm like just that. going. I'm just going by the plain. That's not how it works. You, you know, texts don't work that way. They don't I'm just, just going say by the mean, mean, what they plain say. reading. The no, plain you have reading to, of the text. Everybody reads a text. There's no such thing no. as a plain reading. The, the Quran, yes, for example, is everybody reads text on the plain reading. No, the Quran no is such, monotheistic. There is no such on thing as that. But just because the Quran is monotheistic on a plain reading, so many questions. Elorante says radical monotheism is the epistemic criterion here. J. Quran is. Trikan, am I saying that right? I.e. Criterion. So question for you, what did Dead Sea Scrolls reveal? I, I don't base any of my argumentation on the Dead Sea Scrolls. So it has no, no relevance to me. I mean, there might be historical references that could be had through the Dead Sea Scrolls to, for example, the veracity of Isaiah or something like that. Because I, I think large portions of Isaiah are there, if I recall. But it has no relevance to, to my worldview. Right. This one from Ezio Prow says, Jay, how the Logos could be God, immutable and eternal, and yet ontologically change to become man. Yeah, we precisely do not confess that he ontologically changed. In fact, we confess that he, quote, underwent no change. So God, in his divine nature, undergoes no change, even though he, he, he uh, steps into a new mode of being. And this is why mode is very important. I was trying to explain mode a minute ago, but he didn't have any interest in hearing what I meant by mode. So the second person of the Godhead enters into a mode of being, 
namely being human, the same way that those theophanies throughout the Old Testament that Daniel chunks out uh, show the second person of God, the angel, the Lord, entering into a mode of being, which, by the way, is also in the Quran. The Quran uh, references uh, Allah in the midst, the voice in the midst of the fire, which I'm sure Daniel would explain away. No, no, that's not a, that's, you're just projecting what you think my position is. This one from Grace. Is Allah in creation? No, he's, he's separate from his creation, but he so what's the, the voice in the fire? What's the voice? Yeah, he can affect his creation. What's the voice? Is it his voice? Yeah, it's his voice, but oh, that doesn't so, mean he's in creation. Oh, but he's in the fire. He, he's not in the fire. He's separate. It, from says, his it creation. says the voice is in the fire. Yeah, his voice. That's not necessarily God. Oh, that's Allah, not God oh so Allah's speech is not divine? Uh, look, this is not a problem for oh, right. our position yeah. now. This is not a so problem. It's not like, a problem, right? This is so you, like this is not the problem the of the Trinity. Like okay, the Trinity so is out. our problem with the Trinity is the problem of the, multiple The question minds, is about the Trinity, which you the didn't address. The voice. You so didn't you won't answer the voice, as you guys can see. I said that answer. God is separate answer. from His creation. God is separate from His creation. Revelation, His I know his words I know He's distinct from creation, but your your Quran says He's in creation. No, it doesn't. This one so coming how in is from, the voice in the fire? Do this. this one coming in from Grays174 says, what's more likely that God allowed thousands of years of corruption and finally revealed the truth for his for real this time or that yet another new heretical sect popped up in 7th century Arabia? Exactly. <laughs> Wait, two. Is that a question for me? I think it is. Or is that just a statement? I think it's meant to be an objection to you. It, so there's it's some kind of contradiction for there to be new revelation like this is something that christians accept they think that they have we don't there is new revelation no, yeah you, you have even new revelation until today because you no, have these don't. infallible church councils that's not revelation so you, you don't have, even know yeah. our positions no yeah, we don't the church council no we don't they they're not new together. revelations you're telling they me can, that i don't know the orthodox position you don't consider them new revelations but they are treated as no, they're new not. doctrine that's not explicitly no, not. found in Revelation the New Testament. The death of the apostles, explication in a council is not a new revelation. So the apostles, okay. they don't so even the, know our position. The so, apostles died. There's no new revelations. Daniel. So, like the seventh ecumenical council is not guided by the the Holy Spirit. They're the not seventh. new revelations. They're explanations. Are they guided by the Holy Spirit? That's not a revelation. Are they guided? So when the they're Holy Spirit comes to and guides, the, when the Holy the, Spirit comes and guides a council, you don't that's even not know our position. Revelation. Is again, you're displaying. It would have been a good idea to understand. You, you think you, we're not Roman Catholics, Daniel? I'm not a Roman. You don't. Catholic. You don't accept. You're the seventh arguing council. the Roman Catholic. You don't. Position. You don't accept the the first seven councils. They're the not divine councils. revelation. Does the is the Holy Spirit involved? There's no divine new divine. Are they revelation. infallible? All the are the first seven I can councils make a infallible? Distinction are the first seven councils I can infallible? Make a Why can't you answer? Between Why can't divine you answer revelation that? and explication. Why can't you? Is that a soy hey, question, this, Jay? Gentlemen, you just have to keep going. The Elorante says, Jay. The Quran removed Council of Nicaea shenanigans where ancient Roman principles have been smuggled. Why does Arianism, Nestorianism, and more close to Quranic theology than modern day Christians? Why are Arians and Nestorians closer to Muslim? Because Islamic error comes out of Nestorian and Arian presuppositions. Spartan up north says, he could okay says daniel use circular reasoning okay uh daniel do you want to address the claim that you used circular reasoning yeah i failed to see what the circle was think that you explained That's a it. circle you think that you explained it l2a says within islam how do we in the created order come to know the uncreated god only by other created things in parentheses strict empiricism slash natural theology exactly you accept natural theology? No, that was the question to you. No. We, I have the same position as you then. You explain how you no, can the have question the transcendental was, how God. Do you, how do you name and predicate of God you tell without me. using created objects? You tell me. I believe in analogia. You don't. Who, why do you know why I believe? Because you're Salafi. S Salafi? I'm not Salafi. Salafi, you mean? Oh, 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 okay. So yeah, so deflect the way to the pronunciation. No, no, but, not but the, what because, is my because position? you couldn't what answer is, the what voice. is my position though? Like, because what you could what, what is what, why do the you way say that you why do you claim the way that, that you couldn't the answer the voice? Hold in the on, bush. there's a little too much talking over each other. The way that you couldn't answer the voice in the bush that tells me your position on this. No, that what it tells you is that you've just assumed my position 
and you don't actually know my because position. You, because you couldn't. Like, we don't believe in divine forward. simplicity. We don't. I, to, well, I know you believe there's a distinction this. in attributes. This so one from Neil. I have nothing to do with this point. Do it. Yeah, so this Neil is nothing. Neil fights this is, one. Your question was to you about predication. So he wants to have the same position as you. I have the same position as you. I have the same position as you. How do you know? Oh, you don't. Because my position is. Gentlemen, what is my position? What is my position? Really quick. I hate to just. You said Allah is not like an. Okay, sorry, guys. I hate doing this, but we just. To not get too bogged down. Oh, they say to Jay, was Abraham a Christian? Please provide evidence that he was. Yeah, well, again, if you go to the list of the theophan theophanic texts that I have, uh, Abraham was having a meal with God. Uh, the same experience occurs when Moses goes on the mountain and has a meal with God. These covenantal meals are fulfilled in the New Testament's establishment of the covenant meal with God that Jesus fulfills in the Eucharist or we call the Lord's Supper. So um, within the Old Testament itself, I would just say the multiple passages of Theophanies in Genesis 12, 15, 17, 22 will tell you that Abraham was not a radical Unitarian. Abraham was a Trinitarian. And that's why Jesus says in John 5 to chapter 9, that Abraham rejoiced to see my day, saw it and was glad. That's why the New Testament says that the gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham. Al Arante says, Jay, you are committing two fallacies false analogy or non sequitur in latin and also conclusio praesox in other words hasty generalization they say similarities between both does not mean coupling of falsifiability yeah the argument was about who's in continuity with the prophets the the prophets are in the old testament so that's why we would go to the bible i don't know if people didn't understand that but uh, when we ask who the prophets are, we're talking about Moses, we're talking about Isaiah, we're talking about David, we're talking about people who we have extant texts prior to Islam. So, no, if you ask me about continuity with those texts, we have to go to those texts. That's what the debate is about. Now, Daniel thinks that those texts are contradictory and the Quran is not. Um, but how exactly my argumentation was fa fallacious in the way that you're claiming, I don't understand that. I don't, I don't see how that follows from you. It could be read without you. Does this mean whiteboard uh, your writing and you are three in one or one in three? I don't understand how making distinctions and created things is uh, relevant here because I could argue that the one and the many proves the Trinity. Sure. That's what you're arguing. How does it do that? Because it grounds the problem of the one and the many. How what does grounding mean? Maybe if you understood basic epistemology, you would know a grounding. Yeah, means. if I accept the churches. Oh, if you actually yeah. knew, if I presuppose it. Yeah, because well, you don't know what you don't know what grounding no. means, right? No, so no, yeah. I maybe don't have know a, your what you'll you have a grounding. philosophy course, and then you you're would just using it. one abstract would understand term for the, another. Yeah, I'm using basic terms, yeah. and then you pretend philosophy. like you're explaining, you and it's just hand waving. No, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. I ask you, what does grounding mean? What does it's not my job to educate you on epistemology in a debate? Well, someone is but asking a question for you to explain. You make a claim that, oh, the problem of the one the and debate, the many is the solved debate. by the Trinity. I explain. I it. ask we you, how does it do that? You say well, it's grounded. It's let's grounded have a by debate. it. You'll have a Trinity in. debate with Jake. I want to see you versus Jake. That would be great. This one from Lord Stannis says, the initially polytheistic Israelite God was hijacked and plagiarized by Paul and company, then later by Muhammad, and eventually by Joseph Smith. Fiction, they say. I think this might be an atheist. <laughs> You're both, you both no don't look either. convinced. Okay. <laughs> this one coming in from Momen says, Jay, Jesus is part of the omniscient trinity, yet Mark 13.32 quotes, quote, no one knows, nor the Son, but only the Father. How do you explain this? First of all, the Trinity doesn't have parts. God has no parts. God is simple, meaning that he's indivisible. Uh, distinctions do not entail composition or division, just like he would say that distinction in the attributes does not entail composition or division in Allah. We make the same argument about the persons. And there's multiple statements in the Gospels where you have uh, what are called figures of speech, where, for example, Jesus says, no one is good but God. Other statements say, well, yeah, but also the Son is good or the Holy Spirit is good. So you can't take a phrase that's a figure of speech and act as if the Son has no omniscience when other texts explain that the Son does have omniscience. And so Jesus frequently uses figures of speech like that. They say Muhammad, they say allegedly Muhammad was caught having an affair with his son's wife. Daniel 
maybe this person is making this up. So I want to give you a chance to respond. Yeah, this is uh, just Christian apologetics that have been refuted thousands of times. So this is just false aspersions being cast on the Prophet Muhammad. You know, the thing that I appreciate about Jay, actually, I want to say a kind word to Jay. I find his apologetics more intellectually stimulating and rigorous than uh, a lot of Christian apologetics. A lot of Christian apologetics is just like, oh, Muhammad did this, and that's contradictory to liberalism. But Jay actually, you know, if I can say something kind about his work, it's actually intellectually rigorous. He puts a lot of effort in explaining a lot of doctrines. And I appreciate that about Jay's work. So I want to give him a thumbs up for that uh, as a Muslim. Um, he really distinguishes himself from other apologists who use these kind of tired, worn out arguments. Can I say, too, that uh, I've appreciated this debate uh, in terms of its rigor as well. It's been better than either the Shabir Ali or the uh, Paul Williams debate. So I would say that this one is up there probably with uh, Sheikh Azar Rashid debate. So uh, thank you as well, Daniel.